right, guys, your time is up. Guys, hello? Your time is up. Please get back to your seats. I've unleashed a monster. All right, guys, settle down, please. Okay. All right, guys, are you, can I ask you all to sit down, please? All right, everybody, settle down, please. Next to your newfound friends, if you wish. All right, by the show of hands, who has actually gotten to a solution? Wow. Impressive. For everybody did, who didn't get to a solution, don't beat yourself up. You had two minutes for crying out loud. You all did very well. So round of applause for yourself, please. All right. Thank you all very much. Now, you, uh, uh, I hope you'll have as much fun throughout the rest of the days. I'm actually sure you will. But before we do, let me pass the word on to Jack Parrick, who'll take you through the rest of the program. A round of applause for Jack, please. Thank you. Microphone's on. There we go. Hi, guys. Uh, we are so excited that you're all here. And thank you so much to Leo for launching that and for getting us all going on this, on this Tuesday morning. So my name is Jack Parrock. I'm a Brussels-based independent news correspondent and presenter. And my job throughout this week is going to be to sort of host these main events here in the Hemicycle uh, when we're all together, not in the breakout sessions. Uh, I'm really excited. I know the EPP group is super excited that everyone's here. We have people from, I think, 25 plus different EU member states to get these ideas going, just like Leah was saying. Now, I'm going to run you through a few pieces of housekeeping because this is perhaps not a particularly common room to hold an event in, right? This is the seat of European uh, parliamentary democracy in here in, in the European Parliament in Brussels, obviously in Strasbourg as well, but for our purposes in here. And so there's some stuff that's going to happen here that perhaps wouldn't happen in other places. The first is that during our whole event, our speakers who are already arriving behind us, our MEPs, our presidents that are in attendance as well, will get up and leave and come and go and leave and stay and do a speech and leave um, throughout the whole time. It, it's, don't be disconcerted. They may do it while you are speaking. We're obviously hoping that a lot of your questions are going to be put to them. But just for, the, for clarity there, that is very common in this house. Uh, the next thing is that if you look up behind you, you can see the tribunes, which is where the visitors come in. Hi, guys. <laughs> uh, and sometimes there's a bit of noise going on up there. It can be, you know, that people are doing, having tours and being, be, uh, you know, speaking about what's going on here in the parliament. So don't be distracted by that. That's, that's sort of part of the normal workings of the, uh, of the European Parliament. So the next thing that's proved a little bit difficult this morning is the, is the wristbands. This is a practical thing. I know that Leo already mentioned it. These, these yellow wristbands are really your entry for everything over the next few days. If you didn't put it on properly, if you took it off in the shower this morning or whatever you did with it and you, you, did, you don't have it on anymore, you need it. There are some, I think, down here at the front or some of the, some of the people that are wearing sort of the t-shirts of the event the polo shirts, they will be able to help you to get one. Make sure you get it on and make sure you keep it on. As Leo said, no eating or drinking in the European Parliament. Uh, th you know, obviously this is a, a sort of sacred house and needs to be kept as clean as possible. So, so for that reason, please, please refrain on that. Now, we're going to have a little bit more interaction uh, just to make sure not quite as much movement or discussion, although that was really fun, by the way. Uh, just on how we use the microphones. The whole point in this event, right, is that you guys are here to speak to our lovely EU politicians and our senior politicians at that. So the point is to try and speak to them. The way that you're going to do that is by using the microphones in front of you. Firstly, as you can see, they are broadly, mainly, stood upwards. 
And this is because we would like you to stand when you are speaking. It means the cameras can see you better. It means that, that our panel can see you better as well. In order to make it not a complete free-for-all, the way it's going to work is if you have a question, you will raise your hand and I will come and try and, well, I'll, I'll be telling you that it's your turn to ask a question. When that happens, you need to press the red button on your, that's in front of you, and then the technical team, they will turn your microphone on, but all the others will be muted. Okay, so let's, let's give this a go. Let's have, let's, the first hand that goes in the, oh, sorry, I forgot. When you do, you need to stand up, say your number, say your name, where you're from, say who you would like your question to be answered by. That doesn't, ha it can be an open question as well, but state that. But if you have a specific question for a specific member of our panel, let, let them know. They need to know who, who's, who's best to answer it. They may also, uh, others on the panel may choose to, to answer as well. But for the purposes of practice, let's have someone put their hand up and introduce themselves to the room. No one? Sir, number nine, stand up. Press the button. Hello. Yep. I'm Piers Stargan. I'm from Ireland, from Kildare, an hour outside of Dublin. So nice to see everyone here today. And thank you for, for coming and really looking forward to the session. Thanks. Everyone got it. Well done. Thank you so much for, thanks so much for doing that. <laughs> That's a brave thing to do in a room, of, room full of people. Okay, so just the next thing to do quickly uh, is to talk about the, the hashtags. So the hashtag for this whole event, everything that you're doing when you're posting online, I know some of you already attended the sort of online session, is EPP for youth, so use that hashtag. You should be following the EPP group, uh, which is on, on Twitter, on Instagram, across all social media platforms, and the at you discover EU, you being the full word, uh, discover, and then EU, obviously. And to that end, let's have a bit of fun. Let's see if we can have a bit of a, a surge in online activity here in Brussels. You're not going to have your phones on for, the, for this event, but for this one moment, let's see if we can, we can get a bit of a trending thing going. So everybody, get your phone out and stand up and take a selfie of yourself. We'll all do it at exactly the same time. <laughs> and we'll all post with those hashtags. This is, this is my Ellen DeGeneres moment here, right? <laughs> In the Oscars. Everyone's going to do it? Yeah, there we go. Amazing. Okay, when you... I mean... Sorry, yeah? I'm famously terrible at taking selfies, so mine will be terrible. But I'm gonna just I'm gonna choose for the for the purposes of of, of sort of my social media thing, just because we don't want to be here forever doing this. I'll put mine on Twitter. Make sure you use EPP for youth, and then maybe put hashtag selfie. So let's put it all up. Everyone can do it, and hopefully that might mean we get a bit of a bit of traction going on. A moment silent, everyone doing it? Yeah, yeah. You can put it on Twitter, Instagram, anything you want, but it will see if we can get it to, to go. Okay, mine's up there. <laughs> Just a bit of fun, see if we can get a bit of trending. Continue also definitely to be posting your pictures, to be posting what you're doing here. Uh, I know that the group are really keen to see exactly sort of what, what's going on. We will be following and, and also it's a good way to connect with everyone else as well, right? I mean, a lot of political discourse now is held online. Okay, so once you finish doing it though, Switch your phone off. We don't want any signs. We want, we want to make sure that everything is uh, clear and that we, can, that we can hold these debates. Now, uh, this take gone a little bit uh, over the time, so uh, I'll move on as quickly as possible. And we're going to have some speeches. The way this is going to run, we're going to have speeches, uh, a sort of main opening event. Then we're going to have more specific panel discussions. Then you'll go off tomorrow morning, uh, this afternoon and tomorrow morning for your, for your 
uh, for your workshops with, with Leo, and then we'll come back in the afternoon tomorrow, and then on Thursday we'll do the main presenting here. So that's kind of when you're going to see me is when you're in here. But to launch this whole event, I'm delighted to say that the EPP Group Chairman, Manfred Weber, is going to, to opening the speak, speaking. So thank you so much for being here to all our panelists. I'll introduce everyone as we go. But Manfred, uh, thank you so much. And uh, another interesting factor, actually, uh, the ushers of the, the European Parliament are here when, when the most senior politicians attend. So we also have the, the President, Roberta Metzola, here as well. But Manfred, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for, for being with us. Thank you so much. You might you might be better off going on the on the podium there if it doesn't work. Hmm. Let me have a look there for you, Manfred. Then let's uh, do it this way. So thank you so much, first of all, for the great uh, welcoming, for the great introduction about the rules and welcome in the European Parliament uh, in the EPP family. It's great to have you here, and um, I hope you can already feel a little bit what it means to be part of the European decision-making process when you are sitting in the hemicycle in the plenary of the European Parliament. So when we are deciding here as members, as elected members, then we decide on behalf of uh, millions, hundreds of millions of people. So that's an important place. That's a place of European democracy. Um, I love... This, this, this. Is it now? It should be. Yeah. And yeah, now it's working. <laughs> and I hope you, you can get a little bit of this feeling and the idea of this meeting, the invitation of the EPP group to ask you, please come together with your responsible uh, MEP, was exactly to get this feeling of doing European politics, to know each other, to get an understanding about this. Huh? And you're sitting now in the hemicycle. I have to tell you, this is the EPP team here. I have to say, all of you, you're EPP, uh, that's clear. But, I, but you are sitting on my chair, so you are the group leader of the EPP. So great, congratulations. It's a great thing. And I am really happy because nobody is sitting on the communist side. So that's really great. <laughs> that is already a great starting point. So thank you so much for this. And, and I have to... I have to add, nobody is sitting on the right extreme side. That's also very, very, very good. So thank you so much for this. You know, when we speak about the European Parliament, I, I want to first of all thank our president of the European Parliament that she was allowing us to uh, meet here in this, uh, in this uh, room. It's again a special and important room. And you know, we are very proud to have Roberta Metzola as president of the European Parliament. Roberta, thank you so much for all your efforts, for all your support. And you see on the podium that we have uh, next to her also other MEPs who are active in all the issues of youth, of connecting to young ideas. It's first of all Lydia as YEP president, uh, so our youth organization. It's uh, Eva Maidel, it's Sabine Fahein, the colleagues who are really caring a lot and working a lot on the youth issues. You will meet them, you will have a lot of chances to discuss with them in the next upcoming days. Uh, and I also want to thank at the beginning of uh, our um, uh, Youth Week, I want to thank Sus, who had to work a lot to make this possible. It's the administration, it's first of all Fiona who did the job, so thank you so much for this. And also Simon, our Secretary General, who organized everything behind, so really great effort, a lot of work work and I really want to thank you for this. Dear friends, we do this uh, the first time now huh? and uh, probably we will arrive, it's part of the youth, the year of the youth, this is 2022. So probably if this is a success, if you tell us afterwards it makes sense, probably we can continue in the future because we have to invest in these kind of experience, in this kind of, of common, common understanding and talks. And if you allow me to start with some more political considerations, I want to start, first of all, with uh, this question of how Europe works, because I hope that you can get a feeling about this. What do I mean? I mean to have the idea of a real European debate. Normally on national level, when you're at home, 
you have the experience of your nation, of your tradition, of your, of your history, and you know about this. But it is a real exciting experience to get an idea about 27 perspectives. Huh? The diversity is a big advantage for Europe. It's not a burden, it's an advantage. But you have to be ready to see it as an advantage, to be ready to enter into the discussion and listen carefully how a Finnish perspective looks like, how an Italian looks like, and so on and so forth. So I invite you to do so. That is our daily experience as member of the parliament, that we see this every day, this kind of uh, experience. So that is the how, the question of how the European parliament and European politics works. I hope that you can also feel a little bit the proudness of the whole um, European exercise, if I may say so, the whole European development, especially on issues like climate change, for example, Europe is leading the world. So on content, I think we can also see that if we are united, if we can manage to be together, then we can achieve a lot together. Um, I want to tell you that especially when we speak about bigger steps for Europe, not day-by-day -day issues on legislation, on managing some elements, on bigger issues, like uh, after the Second World War to create the European Union, we see economic uh, cooperation and uh, with, the event, uh, with, with, with the creation of the Euro, for example, so the bigger steps of the European development, you must know that it was always hard to do so. For the politician in these times, it was never easy to do the next step for Europe. I say this because I want to motivate you to use the next days for considering what are the next steps now for this decade in front of us. I'm, I think we all have in mind the war in Ukraine, the war on European soil, so that must motivate us to build up a real stronger European Union in foreign affairs and defense. We need one voice on Europe, on global level, otherwise we are lost. This is not yet the case, this is not yet the case, and that's why to build up this next step there we need ambitious ideas and we need, first of all, courage to implement it, to do it then, then finally. And if you allow me to finalize my introduction remarks with summing up these things about getting the how, that you have a feeling about how Europe works, about the uh, proudness and also about the bigger steps in front of us, all this is, let me say, my thinking because this week in the center of the debate, your perspective is, uh, is questioned, is asked. So we need now your ideas. So please use the next days, please engage, please come together. And finally, if we want to defend the European way of life, huh? because some would ask me uh, what is really bringing us together, and I always say European way of life, we invented this formulation in the last European election campaign, uh, that uh, we believe in democracy, in freedom, in rule of law, that we believe in uh, fight against climate change, we believe in, in the idea of a social market economy, we have um, forbidden a death penalty all over Europe. So we have a unique way of the European way of life, how we, how we see a society. If we want to protect this for the future, we need you, we need the young generation. So please use the next days for developing the next step for the European Union. Welcome again, good to have you here. Enjoy the days here in Brussels. Thank you so much, Manfred. Hello. <laughs> Thank you so much. And now, uh, great opening. Uh, now we're going to turn to the President of the European Parliament, who we're honoured to have with us here, uh, obviously in, in the house that she presides over, really, uh, Roberta Metzler. And I know she doesn't have too much time. Uh, so just one thing, when we are finishing this section, you guys are going to be able to ask questions to the panel. So as people are speaking, feel free to start thinking about what questions you're going to want to put to the panel. Would you like the... I don't you stick on here that. anymore. Thank you, President. <laughs> so, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, you know, I've been a member of the European Parliament now almost 10 years, so a little bit more than nine years. And whenever I look at this room or walk past it, I don't think of the big votes we've had here. I don't always think about the big political discussions that we push through as legislators. I think to an event where I was around your age, it was a little bit of a long time ago, in this room, where I was a young pro-European activist working with friends, still my friends, some of them members of this house today, 
fighting, it was a fight for our countries to join the European Union, explaining what Erasmus is, how interesting it was to speak different languages, how proud we were to form part of a pro-European political force that could be forward-looking, that could be progressive, that could be moderate where it needed to be moderate, but that could also provide the solutions that people look to politicians when those challenges were too much to bear. I sometimes think that today it's like student politics grown up, because that's exactly what we still talk about. And that's exactly why this parliament is such an alive institution that wants to make your life better. Now, this might sound like a cliche. This might sound like, yeah, 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 you know. How often are we going to talk about what politics does? What politicians should do? Maybe all politicians are the same. My main message to you is don't let that cynicism get to you. Don't allow somebody else to take the decisions for you. If you don't vote, if you don't fight for what you believe in, no matter how difficult the hill in front of you can be, then somebody else will vote instead of you. And the end result might be something that, first of all, you don't like, secondly, you don't identify with, and thirdly, you sometimes can't reverse. Why do I say this? Because we are not living a very easy time. When on the 1st of March, President Zelensky addressed us, we were the first parliament for President Zelensky to address online. We didn't know whether the connection was going to work. Few, uh, just over one week since Russia had invaded Ukraine. And this room was packed. It was one Fred, and, and, and thank you, Jack, for, for, for giving me this time. Uh, there were all the colleagues sitting here waiting to hear from a European leader who was telling us that Europe is the only light. That millions of people across the world look to Europe as their hope. Because we represent those freedoms that the rest of the world wants to have. And that we should never, ever forget. Previous generations, politicians that came before us, fought so hard against sometimes insurmountable challenges, sometimes against autocratic regimes for decades and decades. My generation in my country has never experienced war until today. And today, whoever is in a position of political leadership has to take decisions that are sometimes very, very difficult. If I look at my country, and I'm also a member of the European Parliament, so uh, my guests are also here, and they will share this view. What is the number one concern today? It's employment, it's economic security, it's the ability to make ends meet, it's the challenge to make sure that the gaps don't increase, it's also the solutions that we need that we discussed today on the current energy crisis. Huge challenges that we have. We need immediate solutions, mid-term, long-term, but let's not look away anymore like we've done for years now. It was too easy for us to, cheap, to buy cheap gas. It was too easy for us. How many of you are from the Baltic countries? It was so easy for us to not listen to you when you said that we have a problem with Putin. How many of you are from Poland? Slovakia, Czech Republic? So easy for us to look away and say, ah, you know, we will continue, while at the same time being so heavily dependent on fossil fuels from an unreliable, autocratic, menacing neighbor, rather than invest in renewables. It was so easy to think that we will retain our competitive edge as a European Union when compared to our American Chinese counterparts. A country 
that has brought up, with, has been developed on, on such a different value set to ours. And I say this not in order to bring in you know, a sense of doom. I don't do that. Huh? It's not my style. And I also wanted to say, Jack, you said you can't eat and drink in the parliament. I hope you'd be able to eat and drink somewhere. I spent a lot of my time doing that growing up in youth politics. That's exactly where I found my friends. But when you met your friends here, when you spend the next three days here discussing with people, don't only discuss with your friends that you know. Look to your left, to your right. Because do you know what? When I find myself, and I'll give you one particular example, when I find myself in the European Council today with the Prime Ministers, there are two around that table that I grew up with. That I was in this very room, fighting until it was, I think, four o'clock in the morning, and our chair there it was Italian. He stood up on, the, on, on that podium, stood up, actually. The ushers at the time wanted to, were not super happy, in order, you know, to try to find common pro-European solutions at the time. It was the youth convention in preparation for the conference of the, of the future of Europe, which is still our future today, because that has been a very difficult position. What do we do next week? I'll give you a little bit of a snapshot into what we will do. And that's why it's important to, to hear what, what Sabine, Lydia and Eva will say to you today. Real practical stuff. This is what our political force has always pushed for. Real, practical, immediate, pragmatic solutions that leave no one behind that allow for equal access to opportunity, that make sure that every woman has rights across the European Union, that there is no backsliding on any rights. It is time for more Europe. Who would have told us two years ago that we would be able to finally find common solutions on health? We always said, ah, that's a competence for member states, don't touch it. What was our first instinct when COVID hit? We close our borders, thinking that the virus stops at police check. What did we realize the week after? We needed ventilators to move from one country to another. We needed nurses, medical doctors. What did we realize this year with forest fires? One country can't deal with it alone. We saw the help that Portugal was given. We saw the help that Greece was given. I now push a little bit further. We found huge solidarity when millions of Ukrainians, still millions today, fled their countries in the beginning of the war. There are still five million outside in different EU member states. There are seven million internally displaced inside Ukraine alone. We found immediate solidarity. Are we ready to find that immediate solidarity when other people from other countries try to find refuge in Europe, that for millions of young people around the world, the only hope is Europe. The only solution is Europe. Let's not forget that these are challenges that you and us need to solve. At the same time, we also need to be proud because the reason why people want to seek refuge in our continent is because we can offer it, we can give it being effective, having an effective migration policy is necessary. Return those who are not eligible. Make sure rules are followed. Make sure that there is no discrimination. But remember that behind every statistic is a human person and a human life. That's what I, as a Christian Democrat, grow up with and have lived with. So I have a huge speech which I've ignored, basically, I just realized. But I'll just tell you two, two last points. First of all, there is virtue in leadership. Being elected as a politician does not make you a leader. What makes you a leader is being able to fight for what is right. What makes you a leader means standing up for others when nobody else speaks for them. And if I ask you to take away this, this week, is that there will always be people left behind 
And it's our responsibility collectively to make sure that that number continues to grow smaller. And the very last point I will say is hold your politicians to account. Speak up when you disagree. They could be your best friend, they could be your local elected mayor, they could be someone you do not agree with. Speak up. Because if you don't, maybe others won't. Thanks a lot. Have fun, a lot of fun, and good luck. So a huge thank you to, to President Metzler, obviously one of the busiest people in Brussels for taking her, her time to come and speak to us this, this morning. Uh, the next speech we're going to have is from the European Commission President, um, and this is a video message that she has recorded for us. So this is Ursula von der Leyen, the European Commission President, obviously a, a member of the European People's Party. Dear young Europeans, I warmly welcome you to Brussels. In these coming days, you will be at the very heart of our European democracy, where citizens from across the continent gather to overcome their differences and to forge common solutions on many issues, on issues like climate change, the future of work, our single market, data protection, or how to empower citizens against disinformation, just to name a few. I actively encourage you to stand up and speak up in your workshops because this is your democracy, it's your Europe and of course your future. I would like to thank the EPP for organizing this exciting Youth Week as part of the European Year of Youth. In these past years, young people have taught us so much. Youth movements for the climate inspired me for the European Green Deal. Together, we are working hard towards a clean and healthy future. Not only does the transition need solidarity, but also entrepreneurship. Or youth programs like Erasmus are a powerful vehicle to connect young people all across Europe with bright ideas. We are supporting innovation in manufacturing and the data economy. And nearly 22 billion euros from the European budget goes towards fighting youth unemployment so that young people can aim high and we maximize Europe's talent. This is what good politics is all about, to be dedicated, to innovate and to be ahead of the curve. And that is why Europe needs you. Europe needs your passion. Europe needs your ideas and your look ahead. So I encourage you to keep leading by example and spreading the word. And I look very much forward to hearing what you propose in your workshops. Next week, as you know, I will deliver the State of the Union address. I hope you will be listening because I will urge Europe to come together and to aim higher to ensure that our union is ready for the next generation. And that's your generation. Thank you very much for listening to me. So, yeah, so thanks so, so much to the European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen there for sending us in that message. Now, we're going to move on to our, our panel discussion. As I said, remember, there will be people that get up and leave as we, as, as we go through. Um, we have three MEPs who are actively involved in sort of young people's issues, youth issues of, in the European People's Party. And I'm going to, I'm going to let you introduce yourselves. Uh, we will start with Lydia Pereira. Um, and we also have Ava Mardell and Sabina Verheyen. But please, Lydia, introduce yourself. Uh, and th we're going to start a debate where you are going to be able to ask our panelists' uh, um, questions. So start thinking about what, what, what you want to ask. So Lydia, please, floor's yours. I do it, I do it from here. Right? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. Well, good morning, everyone. And uh, first of all, let me just very briefly thank uh, Manfred for the initiative and thank uh, Roberta for being here, Eva and Sabine. Uh, I think we are... This is a moment where the EPP is showing its commitment 
to the youth. And it's actually putting ourselves all together, having the opportunity to discuss best policies and in a later stage to, put, to bring uh, or to take the youth out of the advisory councils to the heart of the decision making. So with this, I introduce myself. I am president of the youth of the European People's Party, and I'm very glad that I will have the chance to meet you all during these next three days and to have the chance to share what we are doing in the EPP and in the European Parliament and what we are doing as well in the preparation for the upcoming European elections. Um, I hope that you are well uh, aware of the, you know, intense days ahead of us. And uh, I hope as well to meet you in another platform, eventually in uh, YEP events. So um, I'm 31 years of age. Um, I was elected when I was 27. And uh, one of the things that I've been most committed to is actually putting the right topics on uh, the EPP's agenda and to put the EPP on the right side of history. And this is uh, in relation to sustainability, to environment, to innovation, uh, to geopolitics as well, and our engagement with our neighboring par um, uh, countries and partners. Um, so this is, um, you know, influencing our policies, but also, and most importantly, influencing our present, because we are already leaders of the present, and we will be certainly leaders of the future. So I hope you will um, enjoy as much as I enjoyed in the preparation. And with this, let me just uh, say a final word to Fiona, who has been uh, really at the helm of this, uh, of this event and to which she prepared with such uh, you know, commitment and passion. So thank you so much, Fiona. And I think, uh, I hope that you all uh, enjoy as much um, as I already enjoying to meet you all or having a chance to meet you all. Thank you so much. So, so thanks, Lydia. Um, yeah, Fiona is very, very instrumental in the whole reason that any of us are here in this room right now, which is why a lot of people are, are going to thank her, and rightly so. Uh, so we'll move on to you, Ava, to, to introduce yourself. Good morning, Chairman, Secretary General, fellow members of Parliament on the podium in the hemicycle, but most importantly, good morning, next generation Europeans. There's such an adrenaline boost in that room on a Tuesday morning in the beginning of our new season that it's, uh, I think, uh, going to keep us going for at least the next couple of months. So thank you for making the way. Thank you for finding uh, it interesting and intriguing to come to Brussels and spend time uh, with the EPP group. I wanted to share a little message with you this morning, a story um, that kind of made me think uh, while coming um, and approaching the parliament over the past couple of weeks and starting my work and brainstorming. What is it that, that you know, we're going to be doing over the, the next couple of days? And the story, um, I hope, will serve us um, to, to show us where we find ourselves um, today in Europe. And where Europe's future and Europe's next generation is. I was in my hometown a couple of weeks ago in the park and I decided to get some refreshments from a kiosk nearby. And the young girl that was selling them um, didn't speak very good Bulgarian. So I saw she was very young and fragile and I said, but where do you come from? It's rare that, you know, you have someone else selling you refreshments that doesn't, that, that can't really speak the language. She said, I'm Ukrainian and I'm 19 years old, but you know what she said? She said, I feel like 39 years old because of everything I had to endure over the past couple of months. Vanya was supposed to start university perhaps this week in her hometown of Mariupol. She fled with her mom, losing one of her sisters on the way and leaving her father behind. So she's now selling refreshments in Sofia 
trying to take care of her two-year-old sister and her mom. Many of you, I'm sure, are either embarking on a university challenge ahead of you or are in having an inspiring career path already. And I think yours and my generation today have grown in the past couple of months um, with a speed that we have never seen before. Because we thought we are living in some sort of seemingly internal peace and ever increased prosperity uh, in Europe. But I think we've understood that this is not the case right now. We were aspiring to very ambitious targets when it comes to climate change, planning 20 years ahead of us or 15 years ahead of us. I've been many times in this room asking us to plan ahead and to look for the future. But we understand that for many Europeans uh, within our borders, the future doesn't seem so bright, so forecastable, so, so, so clear. This is why I think when we are faced with multiple challenges ahead of us, it's very important um, to find the strength, to find the ideas, to propel you to exceed and to go ahead. And I believe there's around 500 of you, maybe a little bit more. I believe that in the next couple of days, we could do that. We can challenge the status quo, but we can serve as EPP group and as members of the European Parliament as an enabler for your ideas, for your aspirations, for your questions, for your doubts, for everything that you might be worried about or that you would like uh, to see change. So I would very much encourage you um, to, you know, use the time uh, in the best way possible during the sessions, during the working groups, while you're in uh, the village outside, while you're having a good time. Because I think by bonding with one another, you could not just create long lasting friendships, perhaps even political alliances one day, but you could for sure, um, you know, uh, come up with some good ideas uh, for you and us together to implement uh, and look uh, forward. As a coordinator of the Young Members Network, which stands for an alliance between the members of the European Parliament and members of national parliaments that are under the age of 40, I believe in the past months I have seen many uh, young people uh, across uh, Europe, bright like you, bright uh, like uh, Vasya, um, that they have demonstrated determination to lead the process of shaping a meaningful but also peaceful world. So I would always like to think that should the world be led by more of the next generation of leaders, perhaps there will be no more wars, simply because those like you, who have their whole life before themselves, would definitely not want to ruin it and throw it away, but they would like to leave it to the full. And I suggest you start today and start this week, because we at the EPP group are here to guide you, to help you, and to support you. So have a very enjoyable, inspiring, but also a meaningful week ahead of you. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, so much to Ava. So, after we hear from Savina some opening comments, we're going to go to some questions. Uh, please start thinking about what you want to ask, start putting your hand up. If not, it will be me, and that'll be boring, or I'll come and start prodding you. No, I won't. Uh, <laughs> but it would, be, it would be really good just to start, start the debate straight away, rather than, rather than me launching it. So, Sabina, please, the floor is yours. Wonder, wonderful to see you this morning. Thank you very much, uh, dear Manfred, uh, dear Simon, dear colleagues. Uh, I think as the dinosaur here on this uh, podium, <laughs> no. uh, I'm, yeah, I'm 57 years old, and I think I'm the oldest one here. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm so excited to have so many young people here. Uh, 
in the hemicycle again. Uh, and I say again because uh, during the pandemic times, it was not possible to meet with young people in that way we are doing now. And I'm very happy that you organized this meeting after a long, uh, thirsty time for contacts, thirsty for contact, thirsty for social engagement, also thirsty for uh, political engagement. And now we have the opportunity to discuss. To discuss. I know that the COVID-19 times were quite harsh, uh, quite difficult for the young people. Homeschooling, no social life, no birthday parties, not going out uh, to, to, meet, to meet friends and people. And uh, that led to many, many problems we want to uh, discuss also uh, during these days. You have behaved responsibly uh, uh, also um, in uh, uh, recognition of the needs and to protect the older generations and the most vulnerable. And now we have to give something back. We have to take your interests, what's important for you, into the center of our work here in the European Parliament. And that was the reason why we raised this European Year of Youth. And my big wish, when I, I'm allowed to, to, to raise this here, would be that because it was also uh, overshadowed by uh, the Ukraine war, the aggression against Ukraine, I would prefer if we could do it more than a half year longer than just now, because we could start uh, later. Uh, it was just possible to start with all the activities in a later word. We had uh, time. We had not the time to prepare everything like we want. And I don't want this year to be uh, just uh, a half year. I want really a year in which we can change our political approach towards the interest of young people. I, we talked already about the questions of mental health which are important. We raised during the last I event uh, here in the European Parliament the question, what is most important? And we heard from Lydia and from others how, and, and also from Roberta how important uh, questions like unemployment for young people, unpaid internships, um, uh, the digital change and especially the digital divide which was also very present during the pandemic uh, that you had young people who were able to be teach, to, to learn, to work in a nearly normal way from home, but others who did not have access at all. And I think there is something we really have to take into account that we have to do something for this generation, especially during the next years. Uh, during these days in the EPP Youth Week here in Brussels, you will have the opportunity to contribute your ideas, impulses, wishes, uh, or suggestions in various topics, in various forums, and to bring in your your thoughts and uh, your concepts uh, from which you think that might be uh, uh, sustainable for the future and will help us also in the decision-taking processes. Uh, we need your commitment to create a more ecological, more digital, more inclusive and thus better future uh, in Europe. And I'm sure that you are ready for this commitment. Because that's the reason why you came here to be heard, to bring in your ideas and really to take part in the European discussion process and in the European development. The long period of isolation from friends, fellow students and other leisure activities during the corona pandemic has left many young people struggling with their mental health. Uh, and the Russian invasion in Ukraine, the war, is uh, adding more aspects to that. And I think that is something we have also to react on. We need more activities to help young people to deal with the situation, to have a possibility to get support, uh, to get treatment when they are really suffering from these things. And I think that is something we should take on also into our agenda for the next years, that we help young people, and not just the young people, but also others in questions of mental health. And I think that would be uh, a point of discussion also here. The job perspective is also very important. And let me remind you that we try to do a lot uh, against youth unemployment on the European level already, but we need your input if this is really working, if it reaches out to you. We have the youth guarantee, we have other activities we started during the last years, uh, and also during the uh, economical crisis uh, we had after uh, the euro crisis. And it was, it was so important that we do something, that we help young people to find jobs, to find internships. We set up uh, the Solidarity Corps and uh, we broadened the possibilities under Erasmus uh, for the 
uh, strands when it comes to vocational training and others. And uh, we nearly doubled also the budget there. So we are already active, but we need your feedback on this. We need your input. If these things are really reaching out to you, if you can contribute to this uh, or take part in these programs. And that's why I'm very keen on working together with you also later on in workshops so that we have the opportunity really to exchange and take your practical, personal uh, experiences into our work. And uh, I'm very happy that so many came here and uh, we want to build together with you a common future, a future um, uh, of Europe that includes young people, especially because future is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sabina. So, so as I said, now we're going to get on to the question and answer. The whole point in this session is that you guys get to speak to, to people that you know, are busy political acti you know, actors. Uh, I always say politics is not a spectator sport. Uh, so it's important to get your hands up and start, start asking some questions. I can see this gentleman here had our first question. As Remember, stand up, say your number, say your name and where you're from and who you'd like your question to go from. It's lovely for you to be the first. Please, the floor is yours. So my name is Fernando and I come from Spain. And my question is addressed actually to our MEPs, uh, Eva Meidel and Lydia Pereira, because they were elected uh, on a very young age. And is what advice you would, you would give to all the young Europeans that such as me want to be an MEP on the future? Thank you. <laughs> Okay. okay. Thank you so much, Fernando. Hola, buenos dias. Welcome to the European Parliament. Uh, and thank you for this uh, great question because I think a lot of um, young people actually always wonder uh, what advices, uh, you know, we can give. And one thing I've noticed that in politics is very difficult to find mentors, to find people that could guide you and help you craft your career. If this is the area, if public service is the area where you would like um, to develop. And I hope that in this week there's um, plenty of workshops uh, we'll be able to touch in depth on that topic, but it's, it's definitely something that, um, that, that comes across all, in all of my meetings. Well, I think um, sometimes you need to be lucky in politics, and probably um, that was my case to a certain extent. Um, but my advice would be, uh, first and most importantly, be active. You, by being here, are definitely active. Be curious, be eager to learn, and, um, you know, try to make some sort of connections, partnerships, where you can, you know, bring ideas to life. Because I very often meet young people, they're like, I have this idea and that idea. And I'm like, what did you do about your idea? Ah, oh, you know, I, I have it. And I'm like, well, maybe you start by writing it down, seeing who you can connect and how you can develop it. And then you build alliances. And building alliances, as our chairman knows, it's one of the most important things, but it's also one of the most difficult things um, to achieve in our political uh, world. Uh, so the earlier you start, the better prepared uh, you'd be uh, ahead of you. So be active. Be passionate about what you're doing, and be curious and build alliances and, and, and long-lasting partnerships. Thank you very much, Fernando. And, um, um, well, I, I'm, I, don't, I'm, I don't want to repeat much what um, um, Eva has said. I, I think it's very important that we somehow value luck. Um, but I also want to share with you that uh, my path until becoming MEP was rather accidental in the sense like I did not plan that uh, when I was, while I was already engaged in politics that I wanted to become uh, MEP in a few years. So I think what is very, very important is 
the engagement and the engagement being a, a private citizen or a politician and the engagement to our community and to our values and to our what we want to change uh, for for better so in that sense i think uh, it is very important whatever mentioned about being curious being having curiosity but also more <clears throat> even more important is when you are engaged politically that you define what are your priorities and what you want to have changed and work on those and as i said when the time comes also being able to value your luck because um well, i don't know some people say especially the motivational speakers they say that it's 50 percent luck and then 50 percent or 40 percent talent and 10 percent uh work well that's debatable uh, I think we really have to do our best when we are in our positions in any occasion in our lives, either in, with our family, with our, with our friends, in, our, in the businesses, in companies, in our community. And it is the same as uh, in politics. So my advice is rest engaged. And don't be, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, question when you don't agree or, uh, or try to contribute when you agree because you can always do better. Thank you. <laughs> my, my dear, both of you mentioned luck. My dear old grandmother used to say, you make your own luck by turning up. And that's, that's the truth. If you're there, it will happen. Uh, num number nine, you had your hand up next. Uh, I will come and we'll get to as many people as possible, but you, you, were, you were next, so introduce Hello. yourself. So everyone, yeah, again, Pierce Stargan from Ireland. Um, I come from uh, a rural community where young people feel uh, concerned. We feel a bit demonized. We're called the problem when it comes to climate change that the farming community is, in, is, a, is a problem, especially heading into a food crisis. I really want to ask why the EU isn't taking a leadership role in helping farmers find solutions to, to reduce their emissions. For example, an EU expenditure fund to help implement things like rubber slats on barns uh, or aeration for silage, which is proven to reduce carbon emissions by up to 30 uh, percent, rather than demonizing the, the farming community. Thank you. We'll, we'll, we'll let Manfred take that, that question because he's indicating, but that is also a slightly more specific. It may sit better in, in one of our other panels. But Manfred, I'll let you answer it while, it, while it's, on the, while it's um, on the floor. What comes to my mind when you, <clears throat> when you describe the situation at home and your, in your community, uh, next to the content. On content, I think Europe is, uh, is strong. Again, we are the continent who is leading the climate change debate, Paris, the Paris Agreement would have had not been possible without European leadership. So it was not Obama, it was not the Chinese who did it, it was our EPP, European Union who did it. So that's on content I think we can be proud about what we are doing there. But what you are describing is more about the way how to achieve common goals and their EPP approach is always uh, an approach of showing respect to everyone to contribute. When I see the debate here in the European Parliament, I must tell you that when left is arguing in these things, they always try to define an enemy, farmers, for example, polluting water and whatever. So they are always trying to build up a political uh, campaign in showing the enemy, the bad things, the, the worst things, the, what we have to fight against. And we as EPP, sometimes it sounds a little bit boring, our communication, because in social media, this enemy thing and attacking farmers about their way of doing things is easy and it works in social media, it's retweeted and so on. Mm. But our approach is the right one, you know, to combine, to bring together, to invite huh? and to assist. Um, and th and that's, that's the EPP way of doing things. Uh, I, 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 fully, I fully agree that in today's agriculture policy and rural area policy, it's not so much about having a common understanding about what is the goal and what do we have to do. It's more about finding a way, inviting everyone to contribute and to be part of this, of this, uh, uh, of this uh, project. So that's, uh, if you allow me to use your question more about describing the political method behind. And there, let's continue our way of combining, of bringing things together, seeing partners and not enemies. Thank you so much, Chairman. So, as I said, we may, maybe we can delve a bit into this a little bit more in, in some of the separate sessions. Uh, there was a, 
I'm very keen to speak to number 251. Uh, you had your hand up. I'm going to try and get to everyone, and I can see your hands coming up, and I'm acknowledge, acknowledging people as much as I can. We've got a session. We've got, we've got this panel now, but we'll move on to others, so we'll get to, to as many people as possible. 251, introduce yourself, please. Is this on? Yes. Okay. Pull it a bit towards you so we can hear you better. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Better? Got you. Okay. Um, my name is Marlene Thälmann. I'm from Germany. And um, I would like to address my question also to um, Ms. Pereira and Ms. Maydell. Um, my question is, uh, in challenging times like this, young people like us are asked to stand up and be leaders. And uh, my question is, how can we encourage other people to also stand up and be leaders and also to um, speak out loud their ideas and just don't, and don't just think about it, but um, doing something for these ideas? Thank you. I wouldn't say it's perhaps the question that keeps me awake every single night, but very often it keeps me up at night, especially when I meet with young people and have encounters. It's a great question, um, which has a very complex and difficult um, answer, I believe. Um, and why? Because I'm sure just like uh, Lydia and other colleagues in this room, we often would meet a room room full of ideas, enthusiasm, actionable, you know, priorities and so on. And very often you would meet um, young people that are disengaged, not willing to participate and are trying to put a barrier between themselves and everything that's happening around the world. I haven't found the solution entirely of how to reach to those disengaged. And I think if we look back in history, there's always been those disengaged. Um, I think today we have way more methods to be engaged and when more, way more ways to be engaged. And of course, some of them are because we are so interconnected uh, online. Uh, and others are because I believe politicians are much more accessible, much more available uh, out there to listen to you. And I think within the EPP group, we demonstrate that on, on a daily basis. When I see how engaged my colleagues are in meetings um, across their constituencies, um, it's truly, truly um, impressive. I think for us, might be difficult to reach out to the disengaged, but I think it might be easier for your generation. Um, I have often uh, met with um, leaders, uh, young leaders such as yourself, and one of my messages to them is reach out to your friends, whether it's in class or, you know, uh, when you meet them in, in, in a particular uh, setting, reach out to them and tell them about your experiences. Tell them why are you passionate about what you're doing? You won't inspire all of them, but you might inspire a certain amount of them that then they could decide to be part of the change and they could decide to become active. So I think we are partners in this. We should do partially our job, but you're the organic people that could reach out to them. So um, that would be uh, my advice. Well, thanks a lot for the question. And if I may share very briefly um, an experience that happened just a few days ago. Um, we were, the youth of EPP, we were in Morocco on a study visit. And we had the chance to connect with, uh, uh, with the reality of uh, um, Moroccans in general. And in particular, I don't know if you are aware, but Morocco has half of their population under 25 years of age. And in one of the, the meetings we had, one of a, a, young, poli a young political leader from um, Casablanca, he told to us very determined, in a very determined way, um, well, what is the question of not having the youth involved and standing up? Like, do you think I want, and with all the respect, Sabine, do you think uh, I want to have only 50s and 60s years of age politicians deciding my future? No, I don't want. I want to be part of the decision. So, of course, we have to stand up. And listening to this, 
and that now connecting to eventually some disengagement that we see particularly in, in, in Europe because the levels for democracy approval are very low, are, it's, are at their lowest state at the moment. But the truth is that we all have a smartphone, right? <laughs> so we all have an opinion at some point, either in Facebook or even with a picture in Instagram or with a, with a tweet or even TikTok now. We have several platforms in social media where we address our opinion to others. So what we have to do is, um, and I think this is our individual responsibility, is bringing all our colleagues and friends out of social media to be engaged with politics. But for that, also political parties have to do their part. Political parties have to understand what is um, you know, uh, what are the drivers that are not connecting to their voters? And this is something that uh, is very evident in particular for centre-right parties in Europe, and we have to acknowledge that. But we cannot just be sitting behind our desks and seeing time goes by and not doing anything. So my, um, uh, I think one of the most important things uh, today is actually understand the complexity where we are living in, and bringing others to drive change. And this can go from social media to the typical um, you know, engagement with our communities. And just to finalize, I don't know, you, 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 I was reading an article a few weeks ago about the, uh, how uh, polit politics used to be done uh, in the beginning of the 20th century. And in the beginning of the 20th century, there was no climate change on the political agenda. There were other issues. There were um, world wars and, and, and other things. But people used to engage politically through, our, through their communities, through their churches. They would meet regularly in meetings, in churches, in different associations. Today, it does not happen. So today, people have moved to other platforms, also because society has become more com complex. But we need to acknowledge this, and we need to bring those people from, you know, being sometimes even a bit frustrated on, on social media, and we have to bring them with, with us. But they have to come with us because there are answers to their problems and to their concerns in our parties. So I think this is where we have to, to make the you know, convincing and, uh, and, and, and uh, persuading them uh, that it is in the center right, it is in our political parties that the answers to their concerns reside. Thank you. Thank you, Lydia, and thank you, thank you, Eva. So I, I can see there are some hands screaming out at me, but the, the first, one of the first people I acknowledged was number 454, the gentleman in the pink shirt. So just, just while he's standing up and preparing himself, we're kind of wrapping up on time for this panel now, as, as always in these things, you know, time gets short. But all of our three panelists that we currently have will be on a future panel uh, coming shortly. So we'll try and get as many questions as we can. Um, we're going to switch over. We're going to plow on through. So, four, five, num Mr. Four Five Four, please give us your question and to whom you wish it to be answered by. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Jesse Jeng from the CDU in Germany. Um, I'm very concerned uh, about the state of democracy, uh, obviously all around the world, but also especially uh, with the developments in Europe. And we see, I think, uh, with uh, what Russia is doing, uh, how important it is that power is challenged and power is checked. So I was happy to see that for the Corona relief funds, for the first time, some countries in the European Union actually didn't get all the money until some reforms were in place. So I want to ask you guys, actually, what can we do to enforce certain democratic values in the EU? Because obviously, if it erodes further, um, that would be a big problem. And as I understand it, it's obviously the transfers of financial uh, wealth, uh, of, of structural um, financial resources into different countries. That's actually the thing that is most important for the countries of the European Union. So how do you think about that? Should those things be linked to democratic values in the countries and how can we go about that? 
I'm going okay. to put that question to Sabina. Yeah, cheers. Yes, thank you. I will take over this because we are dealing with this also in our committee. Uh, we set up the Rights and Values Programme. I don't know if anyone knows about this. Do you know the Rights and Values Programme? Uh -huh. no, nobody, knows. nearly nobody knows it, uh, and, and I think that's the big problem. It's a problem. It's a program we set up, uh, especially for democratic education, for democratic structures to strengthen democratic values in Europe, uh, to learn about what are my rights as a European citizen, uh, to have exchange, and also what we did is we changed the exchange programs, the city twinning programs towards uh, democracy education. Education. And uh, that is also something we give in uh, as uh, one of the obligations for the youth programs, for youth exchange, to strengthen democratic understanding, especially for those countries uh, who uh, did not grow up or did, did have a long, uh, democracies for a long time. And even if you think about uh, countries that changed in the 90s, at the end of the 80s, beginning of 90s, to democratic structures uh, compared to uh, um, other democratic democ Democracies. It's not a very long time, and not all the people reached out to that uh, structures and that way of thinking. And that is a big, big task we have on the European level to um, bring people together to get a common understanding on what is the what are my democratic rights. Because when I see, especially to those countries you uh, have in mind, uh, these. Uh, uh, governments are elected by people and by big majorities of people. So uh, it is very clear that we have to uh, uh, raise our concerns on how we can educate, how we can inform uh, people, especially in the rural areas, and reach out to them. And I think there is something we have to become much more, uh, much better, and we have to do much more than we did until now, really to reach out to people who are at the moment not engaged in European affairs, who are not aware of the possibilities Europe is given to them, who are not really uh, um, uh, Europeans by heart because they don't know anything about that. So our information policies, having uh, a European uh, public sphere, having European uh, approaches is more important than ever also to set something against uh, propaganda, against uh, mind setting uh, uh, from uh, side who are not pro-European and not democratic at all. And what we do as, as European Parliament too, and you mentioned it already, also to make sanctions when the rule of law is not fulfilled in a way. We needed a, a little bit of time because we had to, to bring the member states on our side because you cannot just say as Parliament, now we make sanctions. Uh, we decided on this already very early. Uh, but meanwhile, also the member states understand that we have to do something and that is why we uh, made uh, uh, these processes uh, also towards two of the countries, but we really have to take a look. It's not just the two, uh, the two of them. We have other regions also where democratic structures are a threat uh, in Europe, and uh, we really have to treat everyone equal in this, and uh, we really have to take a look that democracy as the basis of our freedom, the basis of our uh, structures we have in Europe and uh, uh, the way, the freedom we are living in and uh, I think democracy is of the, the, the bad systems the best uh, because no, no system is perfect but uh, it is important really to help people to understand their rights, to uh, get a feeling, to get uh, an impression what democracy is important, how, why democracy is important for them and why we have to take care that uh, democratic structures are fixed in a way that they are not under threat by single governments. Th thank you so much to Sabina. Now, that kind of, we, we're out of time, uh, so we're going we're gonna to move on. I'm going to thank you, Ava, Lydia and Sabina, and also Manfred Weber and uh, Roberta Metzler, who are with us. So, yeah, big hand, round of applause. <laughs> um... So I think we're going to take a bit of an executive decision to have uh, a, just to plough on through. If anybody is desperate and needs to, you know, go to the toilet, just like our MEPs you, uh, and, uh, and representatives, you can get up and pop out if you want. Uh, but for the technical staff as well, we're just going to keep moving, just so you guys are aware of that as well. We've got a lot to to kind of fill in. Um, 
Right. Yeah. So we're going to move on. Um, so as I said, I've, I've got some of your numbers registered down here. We're now going to move on to a more sort of thematic uh, set of discussions. And this one is going to be on machines that change your life. And we're delighted. And they'll be moving up to the uh, to the to the panel up there uh, to have Mairead McGuinness, who's the Irish European Commissioner for Financial Services, Financial Stability and the Capital Markets Union. And we have Tom Berenson, who's an MEP, a member of the Committee on Industry, Research and Energy, and also on the Committee on Regional Development. So the idea here is to talk about jobs, digitalization, innovation, more specifically. Um, we will give the floor first to the Commissioner, who will, who will give us a, a bit of an outline of, of the sort of European Commission's point of view, um, and, then, and then we'll hear from, from Tom, and then we'll continue with our debate. So thank you so much, Commissioner McGuinness, for being with us. We really appreciate you being here. Please, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for giving me the floor. I'm back in the seat that I used to enjoy, uh, chairing debates uh, in this parliament, and it's the very same when I sit here now. People are engaged, people have got to go outside and have meetings, um, and I hope that you realise that this is a parliament that uh, is representative of all of you. Um, I was mentioned as being the Irish commissioner, but when you become a commissioner, you are from Ireland, but you are a European commissioner. But as all politics is local, I know that there are some from my constituency or my country uh, in the room, and some of you have already made an impact. So hands up those of you who are from Ireland. Good to see you. Yeah, the, the rowdy ones are at the very back of the room, but they're really welcome as well. Just briefly, I was in this parliament for over 16 years, and I came into the parliament not very young. I was 45, so I entered politics later, but you might have questions around that. And I came in impatient and wanted to change everything. And I learned, and maybe Tom has some similar or different experiences, that the way to get things done is, first of all, listen and then respond. I think too much of our politics today is about people talking at each other and no one listening. And that's where we uh, have conflict. This parliament is all about compromise. I've moved to the commission since October 2020. My role is to look after financial stability and financial services. And I think young people need to give us your views on the financial system as you engage with it. Because some of us of a certain generation physically went to banks and institutions and looked for loans. I think you do all this online now. I don't know what your expectations are of services to you as a customer or client. Um, I don't know how many of you are dabbling in cryptocurrencies or what you think of that. Uh, my own view is we need to be really careful that these currencies don't become a parallel universe from the monetary systems that we have here. But again, you might have interesting and different ideas. Uh, but the work I do now, because it's about money, it touches everything. Every single policy area is impacted by the financial system. And you know that today the big issue is energy uh, and, of course, the issue of how companies actually um, can have the finance and liquidity to cope with volatility in the energy market. I was a journalist for a long, long time, from 1980 up until 2004. And it was a much easier job because I could comment and write without much uh, implication for decision making. I've learned over the years how complex it is to get decisions made, how difficult it is sometimes to concede on issues that you hold very strongly in order to get agreement with somebody who has a different view. But the European Union is built on the capacity of uh, colleagues from across the member states to find that area of compromise where no one leaves the room claiming victory over the other. Um, and it is the politics of compromise which I value so much today. And last to say that it is an honour to represent um, my country as I did in the European Parliament and to have the opportunity now to work within the Commission. In January we're emerging from COVID, very hopeful of the future. In February um, Russia invaded Ukraine. So you never know what's around the corner. And I think you are the generation that will shape the next phase of the European Union, where solidarity is key, where compromise is absolutely the only way forward, and where, in a way, we need to close our eyes sometimes and imagine what would happen if Europe did not exist or if it fell apart. And the reason I ask you to close your eyes to do that is it's very dark. Because whatever the deficiencies and difficulties of the European Union, and I'm a very proud member of the EPP, the difficulties 
not having Europe would be immense. Um, particularly for smaller countries, for those with less resources. Uh, and that's why uh, I would fight every day for a stronger European Union that represents our citizens. At a time when we will be called upon to be more resilient than we have been in the past uh, because of what's happening um, at this geopolitical level around the world. I want to thank you for being here and your members for inviting you to take part in this. I didn't have the opportunity at your age to take part in anything like this, but I was always interested in debate and ideas. And I love information, I love detail, um, and I love the opportunity of making and being involved in positive change. And I hope that's what drives you here too. I gather one of my colleagues in seat number nine is rather impressive, but I won't, I think you're from Kildare. I did a little bit of intelligence around the room already. Uh, it's called networking and it matters. And you know, you couldn't have this engagement in a similar way on Zoom. It's actually great to meet in person. And thank you for being here. Thank you, thank you so much, Commissioner. And, and yeah, my, my bad for the <laughs> um, for the for the nationalisation. Um, just just one thing. I think I probably you know we've been in here a bit of a while, and everyone sort of jumped up and was ready to to perhaps go and you know do what they needed to do. But as you come and leave, please obviously stay entirely silent because people are people are speaking. So let's let's just try and make that rule. I, I didn't didn't highlight it. But without further ado, we're going to move on to Tom Berenson, who is a member of the European Parliament, as I introduced, and uh, yeah. We look forward to hearing from you, Tom. Yeah, the other side, under the microphone. See, this is the first time I sit up here. <laughs> But we have, I see the same buttons as you have uh, over there, but Marie, you have experience with, with sitting on this part of the, of the room, but I guess we've never had uh, such a crowd uh, in, in front of us, uh, such a young and diverse uh, crowd we have now. So I'm very proud of that and I'm, I'm very happy to, uh, to be able to speak to you uh, today. So I'm a member of the European Parliament since 2019 um, and uh, I'm a Dutch MEP. And the reason why I sit here is something I would like to give to you as well as an advice, is that um, the person sitting on my chair from my constituency before me retired. And our party was looking into new people that could uh, take his seat. And there were a lot of people that raised their hand, but they were all 60 plus. And we need, don't get me wrong, we need people from all ages in the parliament. 60 plus. <laughs> and definitely the likes of, of, of Marait. It was, a, it was a, one of the best, I can say this, but one of the best, maybe the best commissioner we have um, in the commission currently. Um, but what I did is I started the discussion in, my constitu in our constituency asking, shouldn't, be so, shouldn't it be someone from the next generation moving to Europe? looking at the challenges ahead, looking at the challenges we're facing and we need to solve. Um, and people agreed, but then looked at me, okay, so who's going to do that then? Um, and then, obviously, I got the question back, uh, do you want to do it? Uh, and uh, I was in doubt, because usually with these kind of things, we never show it, but you always have doubts. You always have the doubt whether you can do it, um, and in my experience, even more, whether other people think you can do it. Um, and the only way to find out is simply say yes. And then uh, it will lead you all the way here up to the stage in the European Parliament. Um, so what I'm working on currently, I mean, I, I never expected, three years ago when I was elected, I never expected uh, to be a member of the European Parliament uh, while it's war in Europe, on European soil. I mean, the topics we thought were very important three years ago are still important. Look at climate change, definitely. But other topics were added during uh, the road, down the road. And that means that these days, I currently, my most important topics currently are twofold energy and industry. Energy, I do not have to explain to you, and I'm sure that topic already 
I'm now reading faces while I'm talking. That's what politicians do. But I'm sure energy, the topic has been, has been covered or will be covered. But the second topic, industry, is um, equally important crucially, uh, currently. Because I'm the rapporteur on the industry strategy in the European Parliament. My report will be voted on next week. And essentially, it is about what we saw happening in the COVID crisis. We are too dependent on other parts of the world when it comes to crucial things as medicines and medical supplies. Then it showed that we're way too dependent on semiconductors, computer chips on other parts of the world. 70% of the computer chips come from Taiwan. And I don't need to explain to you that, that's, um, that it's not sure that we can have the same uh, supply of, uh, of semiconductors coming from Taiwan in the future. And everything, I mean, everything you're looking at at the moment, whether it's the screen or your phone, it all has microchips in it. And we used to have in the European Union 25% of that crucial element, that production of, of microchips. Now we have 8%. And the market will be doubled in the future. If we have 4% of something that is so essential for our economy, we have a problem. It's the same dependency as we currently have from Russia when it comes to energy. And one thing you do not want is being blackmailed on something you need very, uh, very, uh, you, you need it very much, um, and you are blackmailed by the one person or the one regime you really do not want to be blackmailed by uh, in such a um, situation. And I see someone standing up already, which is usually the sign that I, everything else I really find interesting to say now will come up after the questions. Yeah, I, I hope so. We need to move on. Just we're, we're already running so short on time. Thanks for, thanks for acknowledging. Interesting what, what Tom said there as well. It, being in this room is a, is a really cool thing to happen. I'm a working journalist, been here in Brussels eight and a half years. Very, very infrequently have I actually come into this room. We, we sit and stand up there. Um, and, and so even for the MEPs to go up on, onto the sort of panel in the hemicycle is great. So we'll move on to questions. Uh, raise your hands. Uh, let's go with 407 to start with, up at the back. Stand up, press your button, introduce yourself and direct your question. Thank you. Hi, um, Rachel Curley from Ireland here. Um, my question goes to the Commissioner, Mairead McGuinness. Uh, something I've just noticed recently, like in your speech you speak about crypto and the new forms of financial services. But recently we've been talking a lot about you go to different places, it's no cash, or then you go somewhere else and it's no card. So I'm just wondering from a European Parliament perspective, like what can we do in regards to policy on what what is acceptable and what's not like there's no point of going down the roads of crypto when you go to some shops and there's no cash and then the next shop beside it's no card so really everyone's just carrying the same amount and even as we say we rely on technology so much but if internet and wi-fi goes out and it's only cards then you can't get anything so thank you Look, this is a huge question, and I think your generation probably don't realise how reliant we have become on tapping because of COVID, on not having access to a bank branch, and we need to have a conversation about that. I don't think that things can ever stay the same, but the change in the financial system is radical, even since I have become Commissioner in 2020. The Commission defends the right of access to cash, absolutely. In some member states, ATMs are difficult to access. So we will need to keep an eye on what's happening there. Banks are now less willing to provide those services, so other providers are looking after ATMs. So when we defend the right to hold cash, at the same time, we do know that lots of people are using digital transactions. On top of that, some of you may already be involved in the crypto space, which we are beginning to regulate, and thanks to the work of this parliament. Um, we're also looking at a digital euro. I don't know if you've ever thought about this or even conceptually tried to explain it. I know what it is, but explaining it is difficult. I am really working hard to make sure that these rapid changes in the financial system, that we don't lose customer service that we don't lose uh, the right to ask questions, the right to get good advice, and that's my responsibility. So it isn't a case of trying to pull back innovation, it's to regulate innovation in a way that's positive for citizens, but also to respect the right that for many citizens they want access to cash. And this is something that particularly through uh, COVID, uh, we were using less of it. 
Um, but that is not to say that we want to defend the right to it. One extra point, Rachel, to your comment. Uh, you mentioned if there's outages, but fraud is a big issue. The financial system is constantly being attacked by fraudsters, and you will get all the text messages and emails. Um, Cybersecurity is a huge part of the investment required by the financial system. But I'd love you to think about what sort of financial system you want for the future. Will it all be digital? Where will you access loans? Is there still a role for banks? Uh, because it has changed dramatically since I first started a bank. And we may even be going back to more local solutions like credit unions, etc. So, Rachel, in a nutshell, I hope that gives you some sense of the work we're doing. And thanks for the question and welcome to Brussels. Good to see you here. Thank you indeed. Thank you, Commissioner. Next question from 439, please. Stand up, introduce yourself. So, hello. Uh, my name is Matea Krolo. I come from Germany. And in my, opin uh, in my opinion, the European Union uh, should be more independent from other states outside of the EU. And I mean, the invasion of Russia and the corona pandemic showed us that we are way too depending on others. Um, I mean, the transcend transatlantic relations are very important, but I think that we should push our qualities more forward. For example, um, the Pelyashats Bridge in Croatia was financed by the EU, but built by Chinese companies, uh, which was criticized by media. And of course, we have enough companies uh, on our own that are capable for a project like this. So how can we achieve to be more independent and how can we support our local companies and innovation and by that, I mean besides only financing the project. Thank you. Super interesting question. I went to the Palisades Bridge in 2018 when it was just taken over by the Chinese company to do it. Tom, I think that's kind of relevant on, on what, you were, what you were kind of, what I was stopping you from continuing yeah. talking about. Please. No, absolutely. And I was already hoping for this kind of question so I could elaborate a bit more on, on something I think is, is really crucial at the moment in the European Union. Uh, just to give you two examples, I mean, I, I have a list of, of 25 examples in, 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 over the last months when I was a rapporteur on the industry strategy. But, for example, we are dependent when it comes to cloud services, internet platforms, etc., uh, of, of, of the United States platforms or even Chinese plat platforms. Now, we started not the European Union, but there's a French-German initiative called Gaia-X to gather partners and make sure there's a European solution that we're not dependent anymore of other parts of the world. Now, the partners are Microsoft, Google, Alibaba, and Huawei. Now, you can cooperate on, on all initiatives, but if you want to work on technol technology, technological sovereignty, to do it together with the people you, people you want to get independent from is, I think, uh, a problem or a challenge. Um, another example, we currently use Chinese scanners in our border security, scanning the products, scanning uh, the people that cross our border, which I think is, is quite sensitive information. So on a security perspective, you could ask questions there. But secondly, on an industry perspective, in the future, AI and big data analysis will be part of the instruments that we use for, for border security. If you want to develop an algorithm, you need the data. Who is currently gathering the data to improve their products? It's a Chinese company at our borders and in their own large home market. Now, I think we need a healthy relationship with China. Um, but we need to be more strategic. And there are way too many examples where we were too naive um, and where we really should work on our own strength. It's on energy, it's on defense, uh, it's in uh, technology definitely as well. And what can we do? Um, we will never have the private capital available that there is in the United States. We will never have the state capital that is available in China. The strength we have in the European Union is collaboration. Collaboration between businesses, governments, uh, universities, knowledge institutes, etc. That's where our strength is, and that's what we need to work on to make sure that we have programs uh, to become less dependent from others uh, using that, uh, that collaboration. 
Please, Commissioner. Could I say, it's always useful when there's a problem to find out why it started and how. Uh, and sometimes that analysis is not done. And I think if we're honest, we weren't really paying attention to the intricacies of supply chains until COVID and then this illegal invasion. Um, so that's the starting point of finding good solutions, and Tom has outlined some of them. Uh, we want interdependence. I mean, I don't think we can isolate ourselves, but we need to be, as Tom used the word, we don't need to be naive. We have to realize what's happening in the wider world, particularly now, because we also want to trade with goods and services. On the issue of capital, you are the providers of capital. Citizens have capital. Maybe at this stage you don't have much, but over time we are trying to encourage citizens to invest in projects, in the capital markets, rather than keep money on deposit, because up to now that hasn't paid. And that requires financial literacy. And again, I think we need to do more on that so that we all understand the financial system, how it works, what the problems are, what does inflation mean, how does it impact you. Um, and again, we're doing loads of work in the Commission working with the OECD on that point. Thanks, Jack. I'm going to take one more question on this panel. We're, we're flying through. I'm going to take Mr. Number 33. Our next panel is going to be on our planet, our responsibility. So we're going to start turning a bit more into to climate change. But please. Hello, all. I'm uh, Mihai Mermezan. I was born and raised in Romania. Uh, my question um, is uh, related to your speech about the crisis of semiconductors. Uh, you are talking a lot about it. And I'm aware of the European Chip Act. But still, you are talking about uh, taking the technological advancement and making Europe having some sort of advantage out of it. Still, what are the main actors benefiting out of this act? Meaning, at a global level, the principal players are from Asia, from the States, but not from Europe. Uh, we, you will increase that percentage, but using external capital and external knowledge, not developing something real from bottom up here in, here in Europe. I would like to see your perspective about it. Thank you. Who wants to, who wants to go first? Tom. Uh, yeah, and I assume you want a one minute answer instead of the half an hour explanation of the complex world of semiconductors. I'll take as quick as you can. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but uh, I, I, I agree with you. Um, that if we do investments, we need to make sure that it's in European interest. Uh, the problem with the um, most advanced chips is that we do not have a party that can produce them. And to build a factory, you need five years, a lot of money, and the knowledge. And the knowledge is currently not in Europe. So what I would say, if we invest money in partners such as Intel or TSMC, etc., to build a factory in Europe, the reason why we do it is to make sure that when there's shortages, we also have production on European soil. Now, another part of the CHIPS Act is how do we invest in technological leadership? And there we have a lot of parties in the European Union. So that's a different thing, and there we need to invest heavily uh, because there are many, many partners. And just to, to broaden it a bit more, um, yes, we cannot be independent from everyone. We don't want to be. Uh, trade is, is, is very important there. But if we are at this geopolitical negotiation table, we need to make sure that if we don't have everything we want and we want to get it from someone else, we need to make sure that we put things on the table that others want from us. And that's where research and development comes in. That's where innovation comes in. And that's why we need to continue uh, to make sure that we have the ideas um, and new technologies and new solutions in Europe uh, that other parts of the world want from us uh, as well. That was a very short... Uh, that, was, that was perfect, thanks. Commissioner, would you like to make a comment on that as well? Though? I mean, I think Tom has answered that. I mean, the key for Europe is to make sure we're resilient, uh, that we know what we're doing when we're doing trade deals and what is in our interests, but not to be closed, not to close borders. Um, I think that's not good. I think there are issues about Europe. It's an aging population. I put my hand up as being one of the over 60s in the room. Uh, we need to think about the consequences of that as well. If you look at the caring profession, if you look at those who look after children and older people, very often we pull from outside of Europe because we don't have the resources internally. People are becoming, in my view, rightly so, much more central to jobs and progress. Uh, and I think your generation probably has different choices than I had. 
Uh, my last remark of it is, Jack, to say that um, I wish I had this opportunity at your stage. And I hope that those of you who are thinking about politics at whatever level, push forward and take a risk. I took a, a risk literally, and almost uh, lost two stone in the process in 2004, because it's stressful. But the rewards of representing people are enormous. The privilege and the responsibility that go with it are heavy, you know, as Tom will, will, will uh, also say. Uh, but being in a room with colleagues from 27 member states is quite awesome. And it works despite its complexity. Because when you boil down to it, politics is about people. And if you're a people person and want to get on with people, you can do politics. And so I would just, Jack, if I may, make that plea. Uh, because I'm probably on the way out, but you're on the way in. And Tom's already in. And he's very young. So um, good luck to you in your future, Tom. And I wish you well with all you do. Thank you. Thank you so much to the Commissioner and to, and to MEP Tom Berenson. Yeah. OK. Um, We'll let them go. We'll say thank you so much. On the, uh, on the way out, it doesn't feel like much of an explanation of, uh, of Commissioner McGuinness. She's very much a juggernaut in this city. Um, but we're going to move on now to our, our next panel, as I said, which is going to be our planet and our responsibility. We are going to have Lydia Pereira again. Useful, usefully, we don't really need to have another introduction, which is going to save us a bit of time so we can move on. And we're going to also have uh, Walter Goetz, who's the um, chef de cabinet du of the... Um, Please take a picture, do it while I'm talking. Everyone up, go on, yeah. Get up. Ah, he's going up. <laughs> no, I think. Go, 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 yeah. Say cheese. <laughs> One from the official camera. There you go. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much. As, as I was saying as well, um, uh, just I'd really encourage you, one of the things, I, I, I can't tell you, the, the sort of European year of youth is so such a priority here in Brussels and the MEPs, the politicians, the commissioners that you're going to be speaking to genuinely desperately want to hear from, from you guys. That's why you've been invited. That's why you're here. So reach out to them. If you see them walking through the parliament, talk to them, go up. That's, that's part of what Brussels is all about. Yeah. You, for, yeah, yeah, I'll come for you for a question. Sure, we've got we've got a lot of time. I've, you're acknowledged. Uh, so, as I said, we've got Walter Gertz, who's from uh, Adina, um, Adina Valian's um, cabinet in the European Commission, the Transport Commissioner, and we have Lydia again. So, Lydia, if you don't mind, I'm not going to give you an introduction section, as we've all heard from you already. Um, but Walter, I will hand the floor to you. Just a short introduction uh, about who you are and, and 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 your contribution in this in this section, which now is sort of talking about the the climate crisis a little bit more. So, Walter, please. Okay. Hello. Uh, good morning, still everybody. Yes, my name is Walter Götz. I am German. Uh, I'm a civil servant here in the European uh, institutions in Brussels since 20 years. I worked first in the Commission, then in the Parliament's administration, and now again in the Commission. I'm heading the cabinet, you could say the private office um, of the Chief of Staff of Transport Commissioner Valian. Um, so we are in transport policies uh, in the European Commission. Um, I see the panel um, title here is uh, Climate Change and Sustainability. So obviously transport is one of the main sectors in, the, uh, in our society that has an impact on climate and has to contribute on climate change and sustainability policies. So I'll probably speak uh, two or three minutes about transport issues, but feel free also with Lydia uh, in the discussion, bring up other issues as well if you want to go down more, route, more the route on circular economy, on other industry sectors like energy and so forth. On transport, uh, I would say 
it's a privilege sitting here in the youth uh, panel from the EPP group, particularly young people, I think, according to our um, uh, information and our uh, uh, data, young people have three main claims on the transport nowadays. Maybe you can confirm or protest. First is, I think, of course, the sustainability angle to make our transport system cleaner, less emissions, less impact on the environment. But there is also the connectivity, the availability, the affordability of transport. I think young people are particularly interested to be mobile for studying abroad, going on tourism party, visit friends and families, getting on with the professional life, which also involves often traveling within the European Union or at the global stage. And the third angle which I see so important for young people is digitalization. Young people are particularly used to use digital tools, your mobile phone and your uh, laptop or iPad is probably your permanent, permanently in your pocket. And you can do a lot in transport, which serves the purpose uh, on both sustainability and connectivity with digital services. Let me say two or three sentences what we have done so far in the European Commission in the last three years, since Commissioner Valian came in office in 2019. We have adopted a Green Deal strategy. We have adopted on our side a smart and sustainable mobility strategy. Those who are interested, please have a look in that document from December 2020. And we have proposed a Fit for 55 package, which includes legislation to decarbonize transport, to decarbonize our energy system, and to put the right price also on emissions like the emission trading scheme. In transport, we had three, three legislative proposals in Fit for 55. The e-fuels or the sustainable alternative fuels for aviation. We have, for the first time, legislation to get our ships, which go ocean-wide, the maritime sector, decarbonized by cleaner fuels. And we have an alternative fuels infrastructure regulation that mandates member states to bring in place charging stations for electric vehicles, uh, both cars and trucks, in the European Union. In the meantime, we have also proposed legislation on our trans-European networks, which uh, enables member states through financing to build up trans-European networks, mainly rail and inland waterways, to some extent also, of course, intermodal road and airports. Uh, we are now next looking into a green freight package where we will look in how to move containers, bulk goods or your parcel which you order with Amazon in a more efficient and cleaner way across Europe. I should say, and then I stop already, there are two main challenges for the transport system which came on us in the last three years which have not yet been really factored in at the beginning of our policy making. One is the COVID crisis which has shut down largely our transport systems in the lockdowns, which had a huge impact on aviation and on railways, on travel for many months, if not, I think, two years. And the second impact since the war in the Ukraine, we have a dramatic increase of energy. Uh, and as transport is particularly depending on availability still on fossil fuels, um, the, the, the price uptake for gas, for oil, and obviously also for electricity, which powers electric vehicle, is a massive impact on transportation. So I would stop here and then see how we take it further. Thank you. Thank you so much, Walter. So the gentleman in number eight has been, is this? No, okay. <laughs> 252, the, the, the lady with the, the white top. Yeah, please introduce yourself and, uh, and ask a question. Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Maya. I'm from Germany. And uh, I saw this picture with a girl who's holding, which was holding the bottle, the plastic bottle. And I'm familiar with the German um, deposit system. And it's a great system to decrease the plastic pollution. And I wanted to ask if there is um, an idea or uh, if you're planning to increase this, uh, this deposit system to a U European deposit system so that uh, every European member can use this deposit system to 
decrease uh, plastic pollution. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's an interesting one. I remember on my Erasmus year, which was a long time ago, uh, we I learned about the fan flash and the deposit to make sure that the bottles go go back. I wonder. I mean, this is a suggestion, but it's been going on a long time in Germany. Other countries have other systems. Lydia, I wonder if I can bring you in on that. No, I think it's it's very interesting. I think systems are similar um, across Europe. What the where is not um, what is not equal or similar is the colors to do the recycling. Like in Portugal, the colors are uh, plastic uh, yellow, uh, blue is uh, for cartoon, and uh, green for uh, glass. Here in Belgium, it's pink, orange, and green. If we go, I don't know, to France, it's probably also different. So <laughs> there's not a very standardized uh, uh, approach towards the recycling. But what I want to also, so I, I definitely think it's something, um, If it, I'm not aware of uh, that specificity, and I would be uh, very much interested to, to hear more and on how we could make it um, a standard approach, um, the idea that was put forward. But there's just, if I may, very briefly, and then we'll have the chance to discuss further, uh, to mention is how important um, the agenda on climate is for Europe and is also for EPP. And if we think about the different steps we've been taking since the beginning of when actually environment started to have public support, because if we go back in time, uh, 10 years ago or 15 years ago, environment was not a topic on the political agendas. And because there were a lot of, uh, you know, uh, protests and uh, demonstrations by younger generations, Europe took over, took the responsibility to deliver on this uh, topic. And in 2019, we had the first communication from the Commission on the uh, Ecological Pact. Then during the pandemic, it was right at the peak of the pandemic, uh, we have approved the first climate law in the world. It's very innovative uh, and we were uh, pioneers. And uh, we have been um, uh, very much committed uh, to um, uh, becoming climate neutral by 2050. Uh, so I think it is important to, to, when we go back to our home countries, to understand that no other um, um, continent or geography in the world has done so much for the planet as Europe. So this is what I wanted to conclude and let's uh, catch up later to hear more about that idea. Perfect. Number th thank you, Lydia. But, uh, number 385 first, please. Thank you, Andrei from Slovenia. I would have one question. Uh, Madam President, Ursula von der Leyen just two weeks ago announced 300 billion euros for green tech uh, to reject Russian fossil fuels. But as we know, climate change is a global problem, but a global problem is also hunger. Uh, and you know, United Nations estimated that until 2013, the cost to end world hunger would be 330 billion euros. So my question here is, what is the primary goal for European Union to invest 300 billion into green tech in, let's say, five years, or to uh, end world hunger? Because we know climate change impacts world hunger, migration, and so on. So I would like to um, make a debate on this topic. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much for this question. Uh, it's not directly linked to my portfolio, but if I may, uh, I would say these 300 billion green tech investments are not in a contradiction to fighting against uh, world hunger. In contrary, there's a synergies and a link in between both. I mean, we have proposed as European Commission our agricultural reforms, uh, the farm to fork uh, was a, a catchy title of it, which includes also to uh, reduce uh, environmental impact on agriculture, both uh, on soil and water emissions, CO2 emissions, non-CO2 emissions, and obviously also chemical use and fertilizers use to make it uh, 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 cleaner for the future. Uh, certainly this money, the 300 billion, go in all tech technological sector and, tr and agriculture sector is nowadays very much also a technical sector. Um, 
Of course, at global level, it's more difficult. We have less direct impact when you look in Asia or in Africa, what happens there. Food poverty is more an issue in those countries or in those regions. Uh, also, the food prices are going also dramatically up in, uh, in our EU. So we have a good reason to tackle this issue, and I'm very grateful for raising uh, this point. I think the European Commission has made very bold initiatives in the last two years to react to these uh, uh, to react to these problems and this 300 billion green tech fund or investment funds is certainly a central pil pillar of it. Thank you. Next, next question. Thank you, Walter. Any hands up? Yes, uh, I think you're 437. Yeah, stand up, uh, introduce yourself and direct your question. Um, hi, I'm Amy. I'm from Ireland. Um, and I just wanted to bring up maybe how um, the youth or you know, people who care about the climate, often they have frustrations with how the like, emphasis and responsibility for taking care of the climate is often put on individuals and like the citizens. Um, and do you think that it would be good for the EU to make changes in, like, in its approach to emphasise and put more responsibility on the bigger industries and companies um, that need to make the necessary changes where... Um, the big industries, it, uh, if they make the changes, it allows individuals to make their necessary changes. Like at the moment, um, even you know the picture that was up there with the girl with the plastic bottle, um, it's always put out there that like it's each individual's responsibility to make the changes to recycle, get an electric car, um, you know, use less carbon. Whereas like it's the systematic changes that need to be. Um, focus on a bit more, which makes that um, possible. Do you think maybe that message needs to be pushed out there a bit more? More pressure needs to be put on those companies and in industries that can make the bigger changes and effects? Can, can I do my, um, Well, thanks a lot for the question. It, really interesting. And if I may, um, I understand um, the, 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 the criticism, but what I want to reflect upon is on the fact that there are still, across Europe, not, there's a lot of disparities on the way member states do recycling. For example, Portugal is not doing well. We have very low rates of uh, recycling. And uh, it's, different, it's completely different if we compare them to Belgium or to Germany. So recycling indeed has to be addressed also on the responsibility of the, the member states, in particular the national governments. But what I also think it's important to reflect uh, is that um, any change that we want to drive has to be with all stakeholders. And I really don't want to put the, or to address the question in putting the individuals against uh, businesses and, and other organizations because the main message here is whatever we, we can do to fight climate change or even in some occasions to adapt to climate change because unfortunately there's already a lot of um, uh, consequences of climate change that are irreversible. And so we can only do this all together and uh, of course we need big companies to, con to, to pay their or to contribute with their fair share for uh, this uh, approach. And having said that, I actually have the chance to meet with different uh, industries, with different businesses, and what I see in the discussion, uh, in the several discussions we have with them, is that they don't question their role in fighting climate change. What we can question, what we can further discuss, is how we can actually make this, you know, global or inclusive approach on climate change more feasible, as well for um, uh, businesses, in, in, be, be it uh, big companies or small and medium-sized enterprises, which also struggle a lot to actually comply with uh, the several, you know, commitments we have towards climate neutrality. So the main message I want to to to, to leave here is. Let's not put one against the other, but let's uh, have or let's acknowledge that whatever we want to do, it has to be together and in an inclusive way. I'm going to take two more questions on this. The gentleman in number eight, and then we're going to take 599 up there at the back. Uh, what we'll do is we'll ask you to stand up and ask your question, uh, both of you, and then we'll take the answers from the panel, and then that will be the end of this section. Okay, please introduce yourself. 
Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Italian, and uh, my name is uh, Martino Gennaro. Uh, I have a question for uh, Miss Pereira. Um, Ms. Pereira, uh, she is a member of COMMIT and the European uh, Monetary Affair. Uh, one question. Um, the coronavirus has uh, uh, drugged, destroyed the Italian economy, uh, especially the agriculture economy. Um, uh, what, uh, what are the projects do you have to combat the, the weather emergency problem? Thank you. Directed, go for it, and we'll take 599 afterwards. Okay. Sorry, Jack, I just didn't understand the last part. What was the. I think. Yeah, carry on. Did you, yeah. The uh, program for uh, contrast the, um, the tax of uh, emergency, um, water emergency for the agriculture, Italian agriculture. Well, that's um, uh, uh, something that we are uh, actually addressing at the moment, and there, was, there will be a resolution next week uh, in the Strasbourg, in the plenary, uh, because, exactly because of the um, severe droughts that Europe has observed uh, during this summer. Uh, the situation is getting worse and worse, and what we think it's, it has to be considered by the, 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 the member states and by the European institutions is eventually a European strategy to address droughts. Droughts will be, um, and forest fires and others, and, and other extreme weather events, uh, will be more evident or more uh, severe in certain countries than others. But the truth is that we have, as we have uh, approached COVID, for example, in a coordinated manner, I think we also can consider to coordinate our efforts to address the droughts and, and the populations and communities that are most affected by the lack uh, of water. Um, uh, Portugal has be also, during this summer, had registered their lowest levels of, um, of water in the, in the different, in the different um, de de water deposits that we have. So um, we, ha we also have to consider that we have Spain next to us and that Spain has France. So we have really to approach this in, um, uh, in a coordinated uh, way. Otherwise, we might be uh, you know, seeing certain co communities uh, in, uh, uh, in need for further assistance. And um, so we, we have to discuss desalinization uh, processes. We have to make sure that communities don't run out of water because then we will see a lot of, you know, uh, social issues uh, that derive from the access to water. And that, that can happen in, I would say, the near future. Yeah, the, the, the alarm bells of the agriculture industry because of these issues are really starting to sort of resonate in Brussels at the moment. You can hear it. As a member of the press, that's sort of how we see it. Okay, gentlemen in 599, please. Sorry, it's, sorry it's taken me so long to get to you as well. No problem. Hello, I'm Andre from Slovakia. That's very similar with Andre from Slovenia. In fact, Slovakia and Slo Slovenia often get mistaken, uh, but they are two different countries. Um, well, for the past few years, for the past decades, Europe has been acting like a drug addict, addicted to cheap and reliable Russian natural gas, which has proven not to be cheap and not to be reliable. And in fact, we were financing Russian war machine, so also thanks to the uh, European dependency on Russian uh, gas and oil exports, Putin is able to finance his war in Ukraine. Uh, Europe wants to be green, we want to be energy independent, so uh, there is a very good source of energy which is both reli reliable and independent, and that's nuclear energy. There are some ideological opponents, but uh, I think the debate is much more about ideology than about practical solution, because nuclear energy is stable, practical and uh, reliable. That's something we need right now, and it's green. And I think two months ago, European Parliament approved new taxonomy which uh, labeled nuclear energy as green. And my question is, do you think EU should put more emphasis and more investments into nuclear energy that will make Europe green and independent from Russian natural gas, which is financing Russian war machine in Ukraine and killing people? Thank you.
Young people liking nuclear energy here. There we go. Interesting. Yeah, please, Walter. Just step in and then Lydia, and then, and then that'll be it, I'm afraid. Well, thank you for this question and raising uh, nuclear energy. Just a few words also on behalf of the Commission. Uh, the Commission is neither against or in favor of nuclear. I mean, the, the, uh, the energy mix is left to member states. Uh, so some member states use nuclear energy and some don't. Uh, we do not oblige in either direction. But those who use mem nuclear energy, they are, of course, bound by the EU law, by the nu Atomic Energy Treaty. We have also, of course, uh, the necessary agencies and administrative capacities, and we have also our research, the European Research and the Joint Research Centre, who are all going for nuclear. I would say we have made in, indeed some bold decisions in the last uh, couple of months. You mentioned taxonomy, where we have proposed to have investments in nuclear energy also considered to be green, to be sustainable. It was endorsed by the European Parliament. This was the right message and the right moment, I would say. Whether we shall do more or, or, or less on nuclear, I think we have a good um, institutional frame. We have the good policy made. Uh, after all, in the end, it's now, of course, for member states. Uh, the country I know best, uh, Germany, has a very difficult discussion currently ongoing whether to continue or not with the remaining three nuclear power plants. But as I've said, this is something which is a member state's prerogative, uh, which I hope has to be seen also at member state's level in the context of the perfect storm we are in on energy policy, as you have quite rightly said at the beginning. Thank you. I know, I know you've got an interesting position. Very, yes. very, very briefly, Jack. Um, well, I was against taxonomy, and uh, I really um, I, I, I disagree with some uh, of the positions that uh, the Commission has um, I mean, endorsed in, in this regard, um, because uh, the priority should be given to investments uh, and to accelerate the projects for renewable energies. We understood that it's not only a question or a matter of environment, it is about energy independence. So strategically, the future is renewable energies. We can, one cannot consider that the building or investing in nuclear, nuclear energy, do you know how, how long it takes to uh, build a, a nuclear power plant? 10 years. Do you know the cost of the energy of a, nu a nuclear power plant is much higher at the moment compared to renewable energy? So I think strategically it was a mistake, but I understand somehow the urgency of uh, making Europe uh, um, uh, energy independent given, our, uh, the, given the current situation and given that it is not even sustainable to depend on one uh, supplier uh, for, for gas. But in any case, I think we should still reflect upon on whether this is the right direction or if we should m go for you know, uh, renewable energy because from a cost perspective is also much cheaper than uh, building 14 um, uh, power energy, uh, nuclear power plants, which I think it's a, a mistake for uh, the future. Thank you. Lydia. Thank you so much to Walter and to Lydia for, for being part of this panel. Just on that issue, this, the taxonomy thing, it sounds like, like sort of EU Brussels speak, but it was definitely one of the most interesting sort of areas of, of, of policy where it's not just on political lines, as Lydia was saying, but also on national lines. And this is something where, you know, it's all trying to be leveled out in some way. It was, it was really deep. Anyway, thank you so much, guys. Uh, really appreciate you being with us today uh, and for your time. Yeah. Okay, so we will, we will move on. I mean, interestingly, our next panel, I think, is affected by everything that we've talked about so far. And the, the, the title of it is Challenges of 21st Century Democracy. And we're delighted to have Margarita Skinas, who is uh, the Vice President of the European Commission and the Commissioner for Prom Promoting the European Way of Life. Great to see you, uh, Commissioner. And we also have Esteban Gonzalez Pons, who is a Vice Chair of the European People's Party, an uh, MEP, obviously a member of the European Committee on Legal Affairs and a member of the Committee on Constitutional Affairs here in the European Parliament. So we'll give both of these gentlemen just a short uh, introduction for themselves and then we'll move on to your questions. Remember, uh, start thinking about your questions. We've been, we've been pretty free-flowing on them, in fact, overrunning all our panels so far. So, so, Vice President, thank you so much for being with us here today. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Let me 
first say how delighted I am to address such a crowd in such a room. <laughs> We're not used to uh, people like you. Uh, we see more people like them around, but it's a unique opportunity, I think, and a very challenging moment that we meet generationally in such a symbolic place to discuss what the subject, the challenges of 21st century democracy. Let me uh, start with something that may be uh, obvious, but I think it's worth uh, reminding ourselves of. That uh, democracy was born in Europe. Democracy thrives in Europe, and democracy is timeless. It's the same democracy that we have known. It's the same roots to our ideas, to our values that keep us together. I am uh, very honored to have uh, uh, Aristotle uh, as a fellow citizen in the city of Thessaloniki, my, my home city. And Aristotle, who had studied uh, ethics with Plato, and then later taught Alexander the Great democracy and duty, was one of the precursors of modern time democracy, because centuries before the Enlightenment, Aristotle said that we need separation of powers, that we need ethics in government, and that we need an anthropocentric polity. We need a system where people rule. So when I say that democracy is timeless, I say that these very basic premises from ancient Greece until our days remain intact. This is the same cause, this is the same society, this is the same model of society that binds us together. And uh, if you look through our history, from then to now, you would see that the clash for democracy was always between the same camps. The camps of humanism, rights, anthropocentric societies, against illiberal authoritarian enemies who simply wanted to destroy the richness of our model. This is the same fight. A couple of years ago, we celebrated 2,500 years from the Battle of Thermopylae and Salamina. And uh, Stefan, you will correct me if I'm wrong, I think we also celebrated 1,300 years from the Battle of Covadonga. And then later, we had the battle against Nazism and Bolshevikism. This is the same enemy. This is the same battle. And one very clear message that I have to give you, uh, your generation of young Europeans, that history has vindicated our side of the battle. We are on the right side of this argument, as we were in Gdansk, in Leipzig, when the Berlin Wall fell. This is the sort of Europe that we need to build upon. Now, of course, we're having this discussion at a very difficult moment, where once again we are under attack, our model of society and organization of state is under direct attack, is under direct attack by those, and this is important, that they claim security concerns, but deep down, their main, what they consider as a security threat to them is freedom and democracy, because they see that freedom and democracy is approaching them. It started in Central and Western Europe, then it moved South Europe, where after the fall of dictatorships, then there was a, a brief of democracy that started from the Baltics through Warsaw, Budapest, to uh, Ukraine, Armenia. And this model of democracy and hope is getting closer to them. And this is what they consider as a threat. 
So when they speak about security threat, in essence, they speak about the threat that our democracy poses to them because this will be simply their end. So let me conclude this uh, short introductory, short, I hope, introductory remarks with three uh, flash uh, uh, messages or lessons to be learned, if you like, that could also feed our discussion later. First, democracy is indeed right, is indeed priceless, but it is not given. It is not guaranteed. It is not assured. We are surrounded by empires, authoritarian leaders, that they want to attack us, they want to see us fail, and they will not save any instrument to make this happen. We saw it with instrumentalization of migration in the Greek-Turkish border, in the Belarus border with three of our member states, we saw it with the instrumentalization and weaponization of energy. We saw it happening. So this is what we need to resist. And they will not also doubt a moment to destabilize our political systems. Our democratic systems are a target for them. And just as food of thought, I leave you think why in the last months we saw so many abrupt government changes in Western Europe, from Bulgaria to Italy, why the Finnish Prime Minister all of a sudden is accused of simply being young, why elected leaders in Southern Europe are all of a sudden a target of conspiracy. All this is food for thought. Message number two, the era of European innocence is over. There was a moment where we thought that everybody around us would be like us, that energy provision and energy security will be given. We thought that raw materials and uh, pharmaceutical materials will be available. But it took a pandemic to realize that we do not uh, manufacture ventilators in the European Union, that we do not produce masks, it took us a war in Ukraine to realize that it's naive to think that energy cannot be a weapon and that Europe should stand as a confident player in the geopolitical scene. So the era of European innocence, naivete, is over. We need to be resilient, we need to be confident, we need to be self-sufficient, and we need to be assertive. Message number three especially pertinent to your generation, that this is more than ever before Europe's moment. As we saw it in the financial crisis, as we saw it in the pandemic, as we're seeing it now in the war, there is no member state, big or small, east or west, new or old, left or right, that can by itself stand, withstand the pressure of today's uncertain and often dark world. This is the moment of unity. Only united will prevail, or as someone said, since we're in the same boat, we either row collectively or we sink individually. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President. Now we'll, we'll turn to you, uh, Mr. Gonzalez Pons. Thank you so much for being with us here in the European Parliament. Floor yours. Thank you very much. I would like to begin by congratulating all of you who organized this amazing event. I would also like to welcome my good friend Margaritis, who is sharing with me this panel today. We too, Margaritis and myself, we share the idea about that the history of Europe is the history of the war between civilization against barbarians, against barbarism, and that always it's been that, and being European always is going to be that, being a defensor 
of the civilization against the barbarians. He has mentioned Salamina, Thermopylas, Covadonga. He has forgotten Lepanto 450 years ago. And now we are in a similar situation in Ukraine. It's again, again the same. The Ukrainian people are defending now the new Thermopylas of Europe. It's again the same battle, civilization against barbarians. And I agree uh, with all his conclusions, especially when Skinas has said that democracy is not for granted. We've received lots of things and principles and values and laws from our fathers that are not for wanted. I mean, that are not for sure. We live in the most comfortable society ever. We live in the most secure society ever. We live in the society with better laws ever. We defend freedom. We defend equality. We defend that women are equal to men. We defend people loving in all kinds of forms that are able for love. We defend that people with less opportunities should have the same rights that those who have more opportunities, more chances for getting things in life. We are dreaming about arriving to another planet and we are able to fight against poverty but not against poor people. If you look back, never in the history of our continent so many people has lived with a so long and great peace. And if you look back, never in the history of our continent, so many people has lived with a so rich and prosper of prosperity civilization as we do. So we should be happy, but we are not. We should be confident in the future, but we are not. We should be joined, we should be together, we should be proud, but we are not. Something is happening around us that concerns us, but not enough to make us to be sure that we have to defend those values in which we believe. Mr. Skinas has said that democracy is not sure. I want to say something that it's new in history, but it's important as well. Democracy is not anymore the right answer for a big part of the world population. Till 10, 15, 20 years ago, it was clear that market economy, social rights, and democracy were the right answer for the history of humanity. It was the right answer for everything. Now, those big countries that are around us, threatening us, that Margaritis has mentioned, are defending that market economy perhaps is not the right answer, that social rights perhaps is not the right answer, and democracy perhaps is not the right answer. Russia is not a democracy. China is not a democracy. Turkey is beginning not to be a democracy. We cannot find a real democracy in any country 
in Africa. And, well, some very good friends of us uh, are not in the best moment of their internal democracy. Uh, the message that a lot of young people is receiving is that policy is not so important if you can get prosperity. That it's not so important freedom if you have a job. It's not important to be able to vote if you have a house. It's not so important what happens in the politics if the economy, if your economy gives you what you are asking for, because some material, material goods are more important than some no material, material principles and values and freedoms. It's not so important to be free if you have everything you need or everything you are asking for. And to those countries who are defending another kind of democracy, if, as if it were possible to be another kind of democracy, that are defending another kind of democracy, we have to add what is going on in the other side of the screen of the computer, where democracy is not even a debate. It just, it, it just doesn't exist. Everybody is talking about the metaverse, but there is no democracy, there is no political life. And that's the part of the world where you are going to spend half of your life. So, I had uh, something written to read, but I'm not, I'm, I haven't used it because it was so interesting what Margaritis has said that I felt the necessity of uh, adding something to his speech that I share 100%. His message was, uh, democracy is not for granted. My message is, sadly, for a huge part of the world, democracy is not anymore the right answer. Be careful with that, because we belong to the best society ever, and we are not defending it. <laughs> okay. Thank you, thank you, gentlemen. We have a lot of questions, and we're already past the time uh, that our panel was meant, to, was meant to last for. But we are going to take some questions on this because it's important. We're going to start with number 574 up at the back in the white shirt. Please, please keep your questions um, as short as possible. And if I can ask you to keep the answers as, as short as possible so that we can get as many people in as, as we can. Please. Thank you. Hello, all. My name is Filip Farkas. I'm from Slovakia, representing KDMS organization. And I would like to ask briefly Commissioner Shinas. The post of EU Special Envoy for Freedom of Religion and Belief had been vacant for nearly two years. When is the Commission, commission intending to name the new Special Envoy? Thank you very much. Hello. I'll save you much time. The answer is very, very soon. Thank you. We in the press pack want to know that as well, so thanks. <laughs> uh, the next person that I had on my list was 511 up here. The gen yeah, blonde gentleman. Hi, my name is Oleg and I came from Poland. And as a Pole, I knew I know that uh, we need solidarity. Solidarity is everything in our community. Solidarity is more than words. And what can we do that behind our border, in Ukraine border, Polish-Ukraine border, is right war? So how can we solve this problem together? Thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll start by a step and would like to complete what uh, my, my original thoughts. Nobody and certainly not in this city, nobody should ever forget that Ukraine is the only country on the European continent where people were shot and killed because they were waving European flags in Maidan eight years ago. This creates a huge 
moral, political, and geopolitical stake for Europe. We cannot tell these people or the families of these people, you know, sorry, you were waving the wrong flags. They were, they were waving the right flags. And they are suffering a war precisely because of that. So this is the time now for the Western democratic community, but in particular Europe, because let us not fool ourselves, this is about this clash, this eternal clash between democracy and liberalism, that this is the moment that we need to stand by them. And we're doing it with the six package of unprecedented sanctions of uh, depth and intensity that never uh, uh, we could have imagined. Uh, by the way, those who claim that sanctions do not work should wait a bit because I think that sanctions already work and the Russian threats to cut our gas supply is probably the most tangible proof that our sanctions work. But more than that, more than sanctions, we have to help them militarily, we have to help them as a society, we have to help them as a political objective, and it's not an accident. It was very well intentioned and designed that few uh, months ago we gave them the candidate status to the European Union, a pledge that I'm sure that they will honor very soon. So in a nutshell, this is the new battlefield for democracy, and this is a battlefield in which we will have to prevail as we did in the past as well. I'm, I'll, I'll stop you because I'm, I'm pretty sure that the questions that are going to come in are going to be relevant, relevant to this. So let's go to 193. I know had uh, his hand up there. There we go. Yeah. Okay. Just, just for all of you that are trying to catch my attention, I'm getting a list going. I'm doing the best I can as well. We'll try and get as many questions as we can. Please, Fine. Sir. Thank you, Skinas. Thank you, Gonzalez Pons. My name is Oscar. I'm from Spain. And I would like to ask you something because we have thought about the Thermopylae war, the Covadonga war, and before of that, it was the Peloponnese war. And we are all the time talking about what humanity did in the past to defend our democracy now. But I would like to ask you something, and it is, what can, what can we do now as the European Union or as members of the European Union countries to allow that our society in the future could say uh, the European Union did this, did this to defend our democracy? And I hope that this will not be a war. So, I, I, avoiding a war, what can we do as European Union to defend our democracy now? Thank you. Should we start with the Vice Chairman and, and as we'll continue with these questions, so we'll, we'll keep them coming in one by one. But there is a war. But there is a war. As Margaritis has said, the Ukrainian people is dying because they want to be like us. The young people in Ukraine would like to be sit here in those chairs that are empty and they are dying to get the right to be seated here. There is a war. And the question is, do we care? Do we care that there is people, young people dying in Europe because they want to be members of the European Union with everything that that means? Do we care? If we care, we are giving the right answer. If we don't, perhaps we are those who doesn't believe anymore what Europe means. We are part of the continent who has killed, killed more and better along the history. Not other continent in the world has been so good killing persons as we were. We are those who invented the best war, the best war ever. And since European Union exists, we are the most peaceful continent in the world. That means being European now. And that means defending European values in the Ukrainian war. 
It's not the war of Ukraine. It is the war of Europe. If we don't understand that, we don't understand what it means to be Europeans. Uh, <laughs> So we're going to go to 509. We're going to, guys, just so, just so you know, we're going to extend this. Our next panel have agreed um, to sort of hold off a little little bit, but also you, we can carry on these debates with them. I mean, this, the next panel is about youth empowerment, and if talking about the issues that are confronting young people aren't, isn't youth empowerment, I don't know what it is. But we're going to start with 509, the, the lady there in the, the white top. Yeah, cheers. And um, I think it's great that we all feel that the Ukrainian problem is an EU problem. But here representing Cyprus, I wanted to ask why doesn't kind of the same solidarity um, is shown to the Cypriot uh, occupation that is going on for 45 years. Thank you so much. Okay. You are absolutely right. The enemy is more or less the same. There is a distance of 45 years between the two. And there is a difference that in the case of Turkish invasion in Cyprus, there are compelling factors that are different. There was a coup, there was, in Ukraine, it was totally unprovoked. But having said that, I would bear to differ with you that Cyprus has not benefited from European solidarity. The best, more visible, more clear sign of European solidarity to Cyprus is that Cyprus has joined the European Union in 2004. And that the Turkish occupied part of Cyprus is an entity that is not recognized by anyone in the world. It's a black hole. It's a jungle where no role applies, no law applies, no one recognizes, there is no entity. So it is not exactly fair to say that European solidarity was not shown to Cyprus. It has been shown. But now, I think what matters in Cyprus is to find ways so that the European Union, the European Cyprus, becomes also a fertilizer for stability and security in the region and on the island. This is a moment where Cyprus should become not only a demander of solidarity and security, but also an exporter of security and solidarity. We're going to move on to 149, sir. Hi, my name is John. I'm from uh, Spain. And I would like to know the thought of uh, Esteban um, of the, um, on the election system of the General Council of, uh, power, of the Power Justice in Spain. Thank you. Thank you for the easy question. Uh, I'm going to use a very short sentence. Uh, it's not Poland. It's not Hungary. The only countries in Europe where the power is trying to stop democracy. This temptation is everywhere and is, it is shared by all the powers. That's the reason why in democracy we limit the use of power by all the governments. That's the reason why in democracy we limit the use of power. So the autocratic temptation, temptation it's not exclusive for Poland or Hungary. Sometimes the Spanish government has it as well. Great. Um, 74. There was a gentleman in 74. Yeah, please. 
So I'm Carlo from Spain as well, Secretary General of uh, Nuevas Generaciones and the former chairman of EDS. And uh, as uh, you both were speaking, I was thinking of the great civilizations that emerged in the Mediterranean and how they most, mostly disappeared. The Egyptians forgot how to build pyramids. Um, the Romans forgot how to build aqueducts. And I, I'm scared. What if Europeans forget about their values? And I think that this would be relativism. And I think that this is a threat that is very alive in our society. So I wanted to ask both of you, how do we engage our youth with our democratic values? How do we make this threat uh, present in the democratic debate? And how do we surpass this threat? Thank you. Okay, let me start with a note of optimism. I think that one of the uh, well-known pathologies in the European public discourse is some sort of, uh, I like to call it a European self-flagellation. We always very critical of ourselves. We always think less of ourselves. But the best way to see the success of what we have managed to achieve collectively is to see how others view us. And if you take this look, you will see that what we have achieved in these last 70 years, it's a triumph. We are 27 democracies. The rights of minorities are guaranteed. The role of women is safeguarded in the family, in society, in the workplace. We are the world champions of human rights, of data protection. We have universal and free systems for education and health. We take care of our elderly, and there is no death penalty. This, my dear friends, is the triumph of democracy. This is what we have managed to achieve. But, ojo, Carlos, this is also a burden for you guys, because this is the challenge of your generation to make sure that this model lasts over time. And that will not be easy. Let us not fool ourselves. But this is, if you ask me, what is the obligation of your generation, that's the one. So. I came into politics when I was 18 years old, and I saw Lech Walesa and Solidarnosc in Gdansk fighting against communism. And I said, this is my model. That's what I want to be. Now, <laughs> this is a similar moment. And you have to choose, and I think you have chosen. Your, your mere presence here shows that you have chosen right. But choosing the side of history you are in it's one thing. Making the best of it and fighting for it so that you can preserve it over time, that's not given. That's my message, Carlos. Right. Uh, it's, it's true, I don't know, that the Egyptians forgot how to build pyramids. But we have built a tunnel between France and Great Britain. <laughs> we haven't forget the Roman law. We haven't forget the Greek philosophy. We haven't forget the principles of Christianism or the principles of the French Revolution. We haven't forget anything. We are the Europeans, those who remember their own history. But let me tell you one thing, only one sentence. Remember what I'm going to say, if you want. The next Nazis, the next communist, the next enemies of freedom will arrive through the screen of your computers. They will not come as they did in the 30s. They will not come with airplanes, tanks, or soldier uh, dresses. They will come through the screens of your computers. Remember that. We've got two more questions. I'm sorry to everyone that we haven't got to, but we do. We will have our next panel uh, that will be able to address these things. So the two final questions are the gentleman in number 510, who I think his right arm is going to be very strong at the end of today. And then after that, we can set his hand up for about two hours. And then we're going to have 566, six, the lady just slightly behind him. Um, so your question first, sir, and then we'll move to you. And then keep your questions. I'll continue with the next panel. 
please. Hello, uh, my name is Filip. I'm from Poland. And first of all, I would like to say that I'm so happy to be among of a lot of open-minded and amazing people. And thank you for EPP family to organize such an amazing event. And my question is about uh, European integration, because in the times of crisis, in times of economic crisis, in times of war, uh, countries like mine, countries like Hungary, blocks the important reforms, important European reforms. And I want to ask, how will integration uh, proceed in the future? And is there any possibility to maybe change treaties, current treaties, so this situation like with Poland and Hungary won't happen again in the future? Thank you. In Poland and in Hungary, there were political forces who tried to convince their public opinion that Brussels is the new Moscow. And they won elections by simplifying a very complex equation and saying, look, we haven't come out of Stalinism and Moscow to fall under the diktats of Brussels. That's how elections were won in Hungary and in Poland. But history is teaching these people a lesson. Because now they understand that the new Moscow is the old Moscow. And that the only friend that they have to sustain their economy, their recovery, their modernization, their cohesion, their people, is the European Union and Brussels. So in a way, history is teaching a huge lesson to these people. I am very confident that we do not need to engage in a thermonuclear war with two of our member states to make and see the evident that we need to work together to guarantee that the separation of powers, the independence of the judiciary, that the rule of law are universal European values that are directly applicable. We do not have to negotiate on something which is directly applicable. And I think there is movement in both capitals that points to this direction, that instead of a thermonuclear war, we need to find a way of correcting all these abuses and the stupidity that has governed their action for the last years. And I'm hopeful that we will get there. And you know, what is the guarantee that this method will succeed? This is the young generation of Hungarians and Poles who travel in Europe, who know of Europe, who study abroad, who use the Erasmus and the mobility programs of the European Union on which Sabine Verheigen uh, and, and Pauline Roos will explain you in a moment. This new generation in this country is shaking the old establishment. And I have no doubt whatsoever that over time they will prevail. Thank you, Thank you Vice President. So, our last question of, the, of this panel to, to number 566. Thanks for being with us. Hi, I'm Christine from Germany and I'm economic geologist. And uh, we finally realized that resources are weapon. And in the moment, we celebrate renewable energies as our way to freedom. But sadly, power plants and solar panels or windmills don't grow on trees. And 98% of rare earth elements are from China, and the majority of copper and lithium, which are needed, are from South America and unstable political environments. So I think we have to put more effort in that. I appreciate the Eid Maria. I raw materials academy and these efforts, but that's not enough. So why don't we put more effort in like resource partnerships with stable democracies like Australia, build a European resource academy or uh, agency, and um, yeah, what are the steps we are going to solve these problems? Well, that's an excellent question, uh, but 
that relates to what I called earlier the end of Europe's naivete uh, and innocence. Uh, so I would agree with you that we need to get to our self-sufficiency, but I disagree with you that we have to do it only with democracies and countries like Australia and Canada. We have to do it with everybody, but we have to do it in Africa, but we have to do it on the basis of win-win partnerships, not on the basis of neo-colonial approaches to former colonies that we, you know, we are now in trouble. We came again to look for what you have a lot and we don't have any. This will not work. And this is what the Chinese do. This is what the Turks do. This is what the Russians used to do in Africa before they had other type of difficulties to sort out. But this will never be the European way. The European way is that we will work with partners across the world on the basis of win-win partnerships to make sure that we can cooperate in key areas like raw materials. Please. I'm going to tell you a real case. The European Union has spent 20 years negotiating with, with Brazil a trade agreement. Brazil and Mercosur, a trade agreement. In the end, we didn't sign it because we thought that their environment, uh, environmental policy was not acceptable for us because what they were doing with the Amazonia was not acceptable for us. So, so after 20 years negotiating with them, we didn't sign. Do you know what happened the day after? Chinese and Great Britain arrived there and they signed with them our own treaty. So now they have a treaty with Brazil and we don't. I mean, uh, we have to look to take care of our moral superiority. But at the same time, we have to be clever. Uh, so, Executive Vice President of the, the European Commission, Margarita Skinas and Esteban uh, gonzalez Pons, thank you so much for being with us here today. So I'm now, I'm now going to invite back Sabine Verheyen, who is a member of the European Parliament from Germany. We heard her in the opening session. And we also have with us Pauline Rausch, who is uh, from the Commissioner of Mariah Gabriel. Um, so we're going to continue with this, though. So don't, don't feel th we're going to continue on this subject as well. Uh, so unless, <laughs> please, please stay. <laughs> uh, OK. Okay, well, we'll continue anyway. Uh, so the, uh, if, if you're leaving, please, please at least uh, keep it down. Thank you, cheers. So we're gonna continue with our panel, panel on youth empowerment. Um, and as I said, we've got, we've got Pauline Rausch from, from the European Commission, from, from Mariah Gabriel's uh, cabinet. And we also have uh, our MEP, Sabina Verheyen. So I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave the floor to you first, Sabina, so please, please continue. Thank you very much. The issue we are talking about uh, now is how youth empowerment, empowerment programs can work. What we are doing from the European side, and I'm quite happy that uh, Mrs. Rouge is with us so that she can also tell something about the concrete implementation of the programs we have. Um, I think we have a lot of challenges facing at the moment. Uh, uh, we have many problems before us, uh, in front of us, and we saw that in the de debates we had already today. Uh, democracy uh, and democracy education is one of uh, the, the things we are discussing too, especially uh, when it comes to the threats we are facing uh, through disinformation, through uh, uh, um, non being educated, not non not being grown up, not having uh, grown up with, with, with uh, uh, democracy structures, but also uh, when it comes to exchange and uh, education programs. Uh, we have um, a, a huge number of young people uh, who are early school leavers, and uh, so we are tackling many problems also when it comes to uh, youth unemployment. We always talked at the beginning in the, in the first session about these things. 
very shortly. Uh, in general, it is important to outline that youth is a national uh, policy area. So the European Union can just have a supportive role. So we are always depending in all the things we do on the cooperation with the member states because it lies in their uh, core responsibilities to uh, make youth policies. For many years, the youth trend of the Erasmus program was the EU flagship uh, youth initiative with huge success with more than 10 million young people taking part in this and uh, a few years ago we celebrated the 1 million babies coming out of uh, uh, relations that were set up uh, between people who were in the Erasmus program so it's a very fruitful program not just for those who were participating but also for future generations we saw so um, in, uh, in particular uh, in the mobility exchanges uh, young people uh, uh, have also the opportunity not just to have an exchange inside Europe, but through the Erasmus Mundus program, also outside Europe with third countries. Over the past few years, we have significantly strengthened our policies targeting young people, as illustrated by the new Solidarity Corps, the Youth Guarantee, the Discover EU project, uh, and the ALMA initiative. And nearly each and every year, or every two years, years in the last uh, years we have a new initiative coming up especially for young people but new initiatives are good but they also must be financed and that was something we were working on in the new uh, uh, program um, from uh, 2019 to 2027, where we had the possibility to raise uh, the, the budget uh, and nearly double it. And I think that is very important, uh, that we uh, have more, much more money than before. I know that, the, that we in the cult committee always ask for getting a tripling of the budget, because even that would not be enough. And thinking about Charles Michel in the election campaign before the election of the European Parliament, he was always claiming we need 10 times more budget for Erasmus because it is so important to have young people. And then when he was responsibility in the council, he even did not want the doubling. So uh, that is something we have really to work on. And we need also your support in these things uh, to, to get this done. Because if we don't invest enough uh, in the future of our young people, if you don't invest also in these programs, we heard it, uh, the threats are very, very big, also from regions in the world who are not uh, uh, thinking in a democratic way and uh, via the information policies they have, via propaganda, uh, via disinformation, um, we really have to set something against it. Education is the tool we have to set something against. Media competence, that's also meanwhile part part of the programs we have also uh, in the media strand and in many other uh, programs we have. And uh, it is also very important that in the school already, and there's again uh, the need for a strong cooperation with the member states, we raise awareness uh, to uh, the disinformation structures and media competences. But what's also important is that in the school system itself, we need more information about Europe. Uh, because what I see all the time when I talk to young people also in my constituency, it always depends on the teacher if he is interested in European politics or if he is not. And in this case, we need uh, a structural dialogue with the member states to implement European values, to implement knowledge about the structures, how Europe works, and knowledge about what Europe, Europe is standing for, more into the curricula of the, uh, of the education. And we need this also in the youth part of the Erasmus program, in the non-formal um, education and non-formal learning we have via youth organizations sports and many other things. Here also we raised the budgets throughout the last years uh, on about uh, some 10.3% of the budget uh, of the Erasmus program is meanwhile uh, claimed for, for youth policies. Um, more than 2.5 billion is earmarked for youth activities and that is much more than we ever had before. So we are doing a lot 
uh, to support you, to support youth organization, to support also on the informal education level programs and projects. And uh, I take a look to the Commission before I pass the floor uh, to Madame Rouge. What we are always asking for also in our committee, what I think is very important, that we don't have the big flagship programs. That are interesting things, they are nice. Uh, they are also showing to the outside, yes, we are doing something, but what's much more important is that small-scale projects, that bilateral exchanges, that also the, 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 let's say, not so complicated when it comes to calls and other things programs take part, that even in the rural areas, uh, small organizations have the possibility to make a European experience. And I think that is something we are still lacking a little bit behind. When we had youth conferences uh, on European level, we were also talking especially to people in more rural areas and heard always it's so difficult for them to find the right partners uh, because uh, even uh, via uh, city twinning or uh, uh, partnerships they have, it's mainly just one uh, partner city because the village is so small. Uh, then you cannot set up uh, uh, conferences and uh, exchanges with more than five partners in five different countries. And that is something we need, I think, more also to set up exchange, but also to build up democracy structures. Uh, it's not just big scale, it's also small scale we need. So um, I would stop here and uh, would come to your questions later on, but I would pass the floor first to my colleague from the Commission. Thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is a real pleasure and an honor to uh, share this panel with uh, Mrs. Verheyen uh, this afternoon. Mrs. Verheyen has been a, a long-standing defender of youth policy at EU level. And a lot of things uh, that you are today benefiting from are thanks to her and to her continuous uh, 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 action uh, in Parliament. So, uh, of course, this is for me to say uh, because I've been a testimony of this. Uh, I'm the head of the private office of Commissioner Maria Gabriel. Uh, she's an EPP commissioner in charge of uh, education, research, culture, sports. She has a great portfolio. She couldn't be with you uh, today and she asked me to, uh, uh, to send her best regards because she is in Spain, in Salamanca, where there is a big uh, gathering of of uh, uh, startups, universities, and there she is doing two things that I think would, uh, that I would like to use to illustrate my short uh, intervention this afternoon. Um, she is receiving, she received this morning uh, a youth manifesto, which is a manifesto from the youth, um, youth organizations to tell her as EU Commissioner for Education and Research and Innovation what they are expecting from the EU level. And at the same time, she was uh, animating this morning a workshop with business community and rectors from European uh, universities to discuss about innovative education and a higher education. So these are the two things that I would like to use in my short intervention. Um, the voices heard and the action because the, the theme of this afternoon is youth empowerment programs. I would like to stop on youth empowerment. How to do in our situation youth empowerment is by listening to the youth and then acting. So the listening of the youth, um, I would like also to say a word to Mrs. Verhey, and this year is the European Year of Youth, and I know you're no a stranger to this. Um, and what we have collectively tried to do is to make sure that we hear the voices of the youth, that we make sure that they have um, a forum, a place, a platform when they can actually tell us what they want uh, us to do us as uh, uh, policymakers. So we have this great platform where you can record your message in your own language. We have organized policy dialogues. We have almost 4,000 
um, activities around the European Year of Youth organized in the, in the member states, huge social media campaigns on Instagram, uh, Facebook. We have 6.4 million followers and we have a small communication campaigns like uh, Mrs. Gabrielle is doing uh, on her Twitter account, uh, an EU uh, uh, EU she uh, no she EU leads campaign where she puts uh, uh, the emphasis on one one uh, girl every week that explains her story. So this is the voices heard, and we had as well a, a big uh, Eurobarometer, so a big survey made uh, calling uh, youth from all member states, uh, where we could. Um, see what are the topics that interest the youth most. The first thing was mobility. And on that, Mrs. Verheyen has always already been quite complete on all the mobility opportunities we are offering at EU level for the youth. Uh, Erasmus Plus is, is the, big, uh, the, the, the biggest one with the doubling of the budget, and we are all very proud of this. It was, uh, it was not that easy, as you, as you, as you mentioned. Uh, we have the European Solidarity Corps, which is quite quite a, a new program compared to Erasmus, but still with a decent program, a decent funding. We have 100 million uh, for next year. And I wanted as well to um, um, mention something uh, that Mrs. Varayan knows very well because it comes from you as well, which is this Culture move, Moves Europe, this new action to um, allow uh, the mobility of uh, artists all over Europe. And now we have uh, yesterday, I think, announced uh, the new grant. So we, it would be 7,000 uh, uh, um, people that would benefit from, from this grant. So this is one big top priority that you said that they had. The second big priority for them, for you, is employment jobs and inclusion. And on this, as Mrs. Varayan was saying, it's more difficult because we don't have a core competence as, as EU institutions to do something on jobs and education. That's why everything we can do can be through um, softer means, um, like uh, creating new actions in the Erasmus program, um, um, finding uh, funding for traineeships, so we have this, uh, uh, the goal of having um, uh, 100,000 trainees in startups every year in enterprises. Um, we would like as well to bring innovators at school, incubators in, uh, in universities. So this is all the work that a commissioner is doing with, with parliamentary, uh, parliamentarians. Voilà, so this is what I wanted to say. I will remain short. I see that our moderator is standing. <laughs> uh, so maybe my last question, if I may, uh, to you guys is which legacy would you like to see as EPP use for the European Year of Use? Merci. Interesting. Go, go, Cap, sorry. <laughs> don't let me stop you. Um, okay, so we're going to try and get as many questions in as possible. We, we don't have much time. We'll keep, we'll keep our two panelists here pretty much as, as long as they're willing to be here. Um, but the first question is uh, number 346. Ah, yeah, you've had your hand up many times, please. Sir, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, everyone. My name is uh, Jean-Louis Henf, and I'm from Belgium. 30 years old, um, and involved in the Génération Engagée, which is the political youth of the party which is member in the EPP. Uh, I also thank you for all your efforts in order to involve the youth. Uh, one question that I wanted to ask, but it's more a remark also, is that I realize that even in Belgium, which is quite pro-European, which is quite integrated in some way, uh, there are many young, young people that, that, that are not aware yet of what uh, Europe can do for them. And so there is an issue for me, which is the information, and I realize that there is more budget and stuff, but I also realize that member states and regions and even localities can do more to cooperate with uh, EU on this. Uh, so my question was to ask, uh, how are the interactions with uh, the other level of power, uh, with the medias, because I, I also think that national medias can play a role on this, and uh, do you have some uh, 
like uh, good experience sharing of, uh, of good uh, practices in other member states. Thanks a lot. We're going to keep this like we were doing before, one question, one panellist, so that we can cover as much as possible. So, Sabina, you looked most actively ready. Yes, you raised a very important uh, problem. Uh, we do a lot of things, but how do we reach out to the people uh, uh, on the ground in, 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 in the member states? And I think that's, that's a big problem we still have. We make a lot of campaigns. Uh, we have a campaigning unit, even here in our uh, parliament. We have uh, a reach out union also in the EPP, we have reach out unions in the Commission. Uh, but if you take a look how the reflection is in the media, it's nearly nothing, to be honest. It's sometimes you, you get some reflection in uh, public media, but for the, for the learning programs, uh, normally not. So we are depending very strongly on uh, the engagement of teachers, engagement of national level, engagement of ministries on the regional level, for example, in Belgium, for school systems. Uh, it's not the national government, but the regions, the, the language units are, that are uh, uh, responsible, or in Germany or in other countries. You have to cooperate with a lot of people to get the message uh, to the ground. Uh, that is what I also found out with the um, uh, uh, European Year of Youth. I now had a youth organization uh, in, in my office and we talked and exchanged and they even did not know that we had this wonderful platform. And uh, even there they could not find all the information of what was done and was not. So I think it's, it's not just a responsibility of us as European Union but a responsibility of each and everyone who is interested in Europe to communicate about that, to say that you took part in such an event like this, to say that you made an Erasmus. And that was the reason why there were also programs set up where uh, um, former Erasmus students visit schools to tell about their, uh, uh, their experience, to make a little bit of propaganda for uh, taking part in an Erasmus. Um, and uh, we have, for example, in Germany, we set up so-called Europa Schulen, uh, schools for Europe, where this, in the school program Europe plays a role. But there's not, not all the schools have this. And so we still have to work also together with the Commission and in the exchanges we have, for example, with national parliamentarians to set up uh, uh, um, an obligation to, to inform about Europe better in school. Uh, because then you can reach out to the young people. But that's not enough because also in the informal learning strands, we need uh, better cooperation and that is something where we have to think about also in the future, we can also use uh, modern communication sy systems. Uh, how can we use TikTok? How can we use, uh, Facebook is more for my generation, not more for yours, but Instagram. Um, yes, and you don't want to be on the same page like your grandfather or your grandmother, I think. So um, let's use these platforms uh, also to transport information about what we are doing. Yeah, let's, let's move on. We're just going to try to get as many questions as we can. The, I'm going to tell you my number progression at the moment. We're going to go to the gentleman at 441, then 406, and then 293. Um, just so you know, and then I've got you on the list as well, but we'll... we'll Uh, it's 411. Yeah, okay. your, red, your red light's on. You're good. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Josip Okorni. I'm from Croatia, HDZ. So, uh, I know this, the panel uh, discussion isn't about my question, but my question is really important for all Croatian people. And uh, Mrs. Verheyen, you are a member of uh, the Special Committee on Foreign Interference in all democratic processes in the European Union, so I think you are relevant for my question. So, I will question... Uh, my question was uh, like... Uh, the old Greeks and Croatians said in Medias Res. So, uh, are you familiar with the uh, situation in uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina and problems that uh, Croatian people have uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina? And what is your solution of this, uh, I think, very big problem for Croatian people, not just in Bosnia and Herzegovina, I think for all Croatian people? Thank you very much. 
to be honest, as in being a member in the uh, Committee for Disinformation and uh, in the Inge Committee, we don't deal just with one uh, uh, with the problems uh, uh, in, 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 in these states. So that would be a question you should raise to our external policy people uh, like uh, David McAllister, for example, or others who are dealing ex exactly with these things. What we are dealing with in this committee is mainly that we discuss about foreign interference on what is going on in the member states from outside Europe, how disinformation and propaganda works, but not just from outside Europe, but also inside Europe. Uh, where are uh, uh, struggles we are facing uh, with uh, um, uh, the, 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 the um, Querdenker, we say it in German, I'm thinking about the, 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 the English word, I don't uh, remember that, sorry. It's, uh, it's information. With some crude, the people with some crude theories coming conspiracy. up, conspiracy uh, uh, things, and uh, especially when we have uh, the disinformation which comes from China, from Russia, uh, but also um, Donald Trump was uh, one of the specialists when it comes to disinformation and alternative facts. Uh, how to deal with this? how the attacks are structured, how long is it going, what uh, is done in this. That are things we are dealing with in this committee. Um, and I think we should uh, take also uh, um, the propaganda that is set out uh, by uh, uh, Russian forces, for example, in the Baltic states, but also on the, ba uh, uh, in, 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 on the Balkans, when it comes to impact into Serbia, impact into other uh, uh, Western Balkan states uh, with propaganda from Russia against those who are already member states uh, of the European Union and against uh, uh, other activities and democracy. I think that is very important that we find the right tools to protect our citizens. But that is what I already said uh, this morning in the first panel, but also uh, at the beginning. Um, education, media competence is one of the, of the clues uh, we were defining uh, also in this committee to help uh, people to deal with this because you cannot block everything. Uh, you cannot just get rid of these things, but you must know about it, you must inform about it, and you must uh, educate people how to deal with this. And uh, I think that's one of the most important points. Yeah, I, I fear, sir, that you did had, have your hand up in the previous panel where that question may have landed a bit better, and I, I apologize for you. But Sabina, thank you for a comprehensive answer from your your point of view. So I think it was 406. Yeah, please. What's your name? Where are you from? Hi, I'm Lucy and I'm from Ireland. Earlier on, we described ourselves as lucky to be involved in politics. So I want to ask the panel, what can we be done on an EU level to help marginalised communities to feel empowered to be in society and in politics? Paul Pauline, yeah, go for it. In a half a, a half a minute, there will be a very short time frame to answer your, your question. Listen, uh, I think um, Vice President Skinner uh, was saying this uh, in the panel before. I mean, first, what is needed is that the young generation are ready to engage, and the fact that you are all taking time to come over to Brussels uh, from your, your home country, from your activities, uh, to spend a couple of days uh, exchanging exchanging ideas with people with whom you share values uh, from different social and cultural backgrounds, this is this is the best thing to do. This is, first, it's to create this um, eagerness to engage. And this is what we are trying to do by showing that we are listening and we are acting. But then we count on, as well, the young people, you, to engage. This is not something we can do for you. So what we can do is to show that we are listening and we are acting. We are creating conditions. I will not start with this, but we have as well changed. Uh, you are like me, uh, a woman. Uh, so we have uh, changed things. Uh, I think compared to even 10 years ago, there is a, a lot of things that have been done 
pushed by this House, by the European Parliament, Mrs. Gabrielle as well. It's something she's been fighting for for a decade, more than a decade, on how to make sure that politics are also fit to a li the life of a woman. Of woman. So it's, I think the conditions are better, clearly better, uh, but uh, the, the, the eagerness to engage, uh, this will remain on, on each and every one of us, of you. Th thank you so much, Pauline. So now we'll go to number 293. Please introduce yourself. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Sarah Reed. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, I'm from Lugo, northern Spain, and there we are deeply concerned uh, about the working youth agriculture in uh, uh, is decreasing. Which are the demo demographic measures that are being taken? And I would like to know what is your opinion on the common agricultural policy? It's a very important point in our region and for young people too. Thank you very much. Interesting, we've had a few questions about this. I don't know how, how much our panelists here are going to be able to talk too much about the common agricultural policy. I'm sure Sabina will have some comment that, that she may wish to make, but... I'm not a specialist for agricultural com uh, politics, yeah. but I'm, uh, uh, I worked a lot uh, because I'm also coming from a region where we have a university city, but also uh, a big uh, 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 important rural area uh, part, so the development of rural areas is important for, for me too. Uh, but what is important uh, um, to have an involvement of young people also in uh, how they think their future is looks like, also for the rural areas, also for those things that are dependent uh, in these uh, development structures. And I think uh, to to give in your impact is so important as young people, also for the the, the plans that are made for these these area. When I take a look, for example when they are elaborating the operational programs for the rural area development funds, uh, like the leader programs and others, uh, I always ask already in the past, is the young generation, are young people involved in the development of these things? How can they bring in their ideas to the future of the region they are living in? It's not just youth policy, you should be included in the decision-taking processes, but uh, to define your ideas, to find partners, to find people you can talk to, to find the people that are responsible for the decision-taking process and push forward for your ideas. That can help uh, also to bring more impact of young people also in uh, rural development uh, uh, structures in uh, the uh, all political areas even when it comes to fisheries there might be also an aspect uh, for young people who are interested in how their future look should look like in this area or uh, uh, also environmental questions and that is something why we asked here also in the conference of committee chairs that all the committees in this year should try and ex make experiments with involving young people in the debates. Right, we've, we've got two more questions. I'm really, really sorry to those that I haven't been able to get to. We're going to go to number 34 and to 108. Uh, they were the next in line. I'm really sorry. You have got all week, though. We're here all week. We come back tomorrow at 4 p.m. We'll have another, another debate of this <coughs> nature, so you can have your hands up then. We'll also... Be back. Oh, you're going to do your, your uh, workshops this afternoon and tomorrow morning, and then obviously on Thursday morning we'll be, do, we'll be dealing with the results of that, and there will be more discussions on this. So I'm extremely sorry if I haven't managed to get to you. I've done my best, I promise. So the gentle, what we're going to do is, the gentleman at 34, you ask your question. Uh, please, you at number one, 108, you ask your question, and then we'll put them to the panel, and then that'll be the end of it. Okay, sir. Uh, hello, I'm Alex. I'm from Romania, and I have a question regarding the financial sustainability of students and the life as a student. Uh, I myself am a student, I study civil engineering in Romania and I find myself also working because life as a student may also involve financial costs and maybe I don't want all the costs to be covered by my family or so on and I want to be independent and by the time I finish university I want to have maybe no debts and be able to start life. So I'm curious about what policies did, does the European Union have in plan or is already working on to maybe help students go to their 
financial situation during the university, like, I don't know, maybe a VAT deduction or something. Thank you very much, and I look forward for your answer. An interesting question, as someone who still pays off his student loan <laughs> to this day. Uh, uh, number 108, please ask your question. Yeah. Hi, my name is Helen Marquidu, and I come from Cyprus. My question is a bit different. Um, I believe that I'm a leader, and I also believe it's my mission to refer to this. So focusing on the Cyprus problem that has been going on for more than 40, 45 years, um, all the refugees are, are still trying to recover since they lost everything. So how is the European Union uh, defending Cyprus now? How can I defend my own European values? Just like you said, we have to stick together. Uh, we are grateful for all the support and we are still, um, we expect the same support uh, from our political journey, but this is not enough. We are still, um, being triggered by Turkey in various occasions, and we still don't feel safe. So my question as a leader, how can I help, or how can I keep the European Union attention to the Cyprus problem until we find a solution? Thank you. Can I, can I ask you, were you here in the previous panel? Were you present? No. We had a whole debate about this, actually. A question came in very similarly from one of your colleagues, and she asked, and that was sort of about protecting democracy and stuff, so I'm sad you weren't here. If, if you're willing to, to answer and to talk on that, then, then that's okay. But if not, the question about student debts and dealing with that, I suppose, Pauline, if we can, if we can start with you. Many thanks. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a very good uh, question you, you were asking. I mean, I will uh, bluntly reply, uh, no, I mean, uh, VAT, things, the things that you mentioned, we, we are not doing this. Um, just to, to remind you of a couple of things. Uh, enfin, the way the EU is built and the, comp the sharing of competences uh, with member states make uh, is, is how it is, and this type of supporting economic uh, policies are up to the member states. We can encourage them to think about uh, to about, about them. We have a yearly uh, exercise in macroeconomic and microeconomic policy, and uh, and we have a dedicated uh, session a discussion with uh, each and every member state on education and use. So uh, this is where we discuss those things, but we don't have core competence uh, to act. Um, what I want to say as well is that uh, investing in education is a topic that uh, we've been having with uh, member states for for some time. Um, there is now even a, a special group and uh, ministers, uh, education ministers and uh, and uh, finance ministers from time to time have a meeting together um, last time I think it was before COVID so it was a bit uh, some time ago uh, where they discuss exactly those things what we can do as EU level is to um, make sure that we put together the right partners to have this discussion but uh, it's difficult for us for us to act uh, um, in a direct way this is what I wanted to say. Just to add uh, on this, uh, uh, you know that in many countries there are national scholarship programs for students uh, to support them, uh, especially in those families where you have uh, financial difficulties to finance a study. Uh, there are different uh, uh, traditions in the European member states. If you have to pay a fee for uh, uh, starting a study at a university or not, we have countries with fees, we have countries without fees, but that is depending on the national competence, like uh, Pauline already said. And uh, what we can do on the European level is to make best practice exchanges, to um, uh, support member states and the ministries and uh, the uh, relevant, uh, um, relevant uh, structures and, and people to talk to each other, to exchange and take a look uh, how can we learn from each other. That's also something we do in the Erasmus program, that's something we do in the exchange programs for universities, not just for the teachers, uh, not just for the uh, students, but also for teachers, for university uh, professors, for uh, staff working at a university, because it is important to uh, see the whole scene and not just uh, the single student.
student in this uh, to get uh, a better approach, and that is what we are working on. Um, coming to the Cyprus question, uh, it said it was all, uh, already discussed very intensively in the in the, uh, uh, form, in the, in the previous panel, and. Um, so uh, I think we are aware on what is going on in Cyprus. It's not that we at the, on the European Union level don't see uh, what's going on in these countries. One of my members in the committee uh, I'm uh, leading uh, is uh, someone from the Turkish minority in Cyprus. Uh, he is uh, uh, fighting for Cyprus, for the rights, for the recognition. And what we do as European Union is to say very clear. Whole Cyprus is part of the European Union and also those who are living on the uh, Turkish occupied part are Europeans and that is the most support we can give that we don't divide Cyprus as European Union but take it as a complete uh, state for us in our recognition and that also people living on the uh, uh, Turkish part can be elected, can be representative here and can bring in uh, their uh, uh, ideas and their needs and uh, especially when you have people who feel European living on the other side and when we can support people also on the on the on the Turkish occupied part uh, with uh, 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 the European programs and bring uh, all these European ideas to that side that will help most to find solutions in the long term for the conflict that is there and also that we made quite clear that, the, that Turkey never can be part of the European Union without respecting Cyprus in its whole, in its integrity. And I think uh, that is also said very, very clear that uh, there is no chance for Turkey at any time to get uh, a full member when they don't recognize the integrity of Cyprus. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm, I'm sad you weren't here because it was uh, the the executive vice president Margarita Skinas gave a pretty um, uh, like a full assessment from his point of view at least. Maybe it's worth uh, just rewinding on the um, on the live stream and checking out what he said if you're interested. Um, and obviously, I'm sure you'll be bringing that up to to everybody uh, throughout the rest of the sessions. So I'd like to give a huge thank you to Sabina Verhayen and to Pauline Rausch for being here. Um, so that wraps up all our panels. I mean, a, a lot of interesting, big discussions, and we've got a long way to go. This is only the first sort of major day of the discussions. I'm going to wish you all the best. I hope you all know where you're going with your with your things for the workshops this afternoon and tomorrow morning. Uh, I will see you at Auto World this evening for a drink, I hope. Um, and if not, then the next time you'll see me is here in the Hemicycle at 4 p.m. tomorrow when we'll have a discussion again with Manfred Weber. So... Go and have lunch. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Okay.